call this meeting to order. At this time, if you're able, please rise and uh, for the national anthem. This time I'll call on Councillor Beauregard for the land acknowledgement. The Niagara region is situated on treaty land. This land is steeped in the rich history of the First Nations, such as the Haudenosaunee, the Haudenosaunee, and the Anishinaabe, including the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. There are many First Nation, Métis, and Inuit people from across Turtle Island that live and work in Niagara today. The City of Port Colborne stands with all Indigenous people, past and present, in promoting the wise stewardship of the lands on which we live. Thank you, Councillor. We have one proclamation this evening, the Canadian Viral Hepatitis Elimination Day for May 9th of 2024. If I could have Councillors Bodner and Hoyle move that. Any questions? All in favor? That's carried. If I could have Councillors Danch and Elliot move the agenda with the following changes. We're going to do item 8.7 prior to 8.5 based on Mr. Schapowski's uh, ask for that. Madam Clerk, on the addendum. We do have two addendums, Your Worship. We do have addendums this evening, Your Worship. They have been posted. They're on the website and available for viewing. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Questions or other changes to the agenda? All those in favor? That's carried. Of the items tonight, any disclosures of interest? Seeing none. We have four sets of minutes, Council. We have the regular meeting of Council, March 26, 2024. Special meeting of Council, closed session, January 23, 2024. Special Council minutes, closed session, January 27, 2024. And the Special Council minutes, closed session, February 27, 2024. If I could have Councillors Bruno and Baggy move those. Questions on any of the minutes? All in favor? That's carried. The following reports are pulled for separate discussion. 8.1, 8.2, 8.3, 8.4, 8.5, 8.6, 8.7, 8.8, 8.9, 9.5, and 9.10, and 9.1 and 9.2 that came in late. Any other items, councillors, that you want to pull? If I, go ahead. 9.10, yes. Okay. Yep, that's that okay. Any further items? Councilor Borgard and Aquilina move uh, the remainder of the items that haven't been pulled. All those in favor? That's carried. We have two presentations this evening. Our first presentation is from Mark Carl, the Chief Executive Officer for Habitat for Humanity Niagara. Come on up, Mark. Welcome, and just press the red button there. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor and City Council of Port Colborne uh, and residents of Port Colborne. Uh, I'm here today. I'm joined with uh, Chelsea Meisner from Habitat for Humanity Niagara. And uh, it excites us on behalf of Habitat for Humanity Niagara to be here and back in Port Colborne. And uh, 
we're excited that the reason that we're here tonight is to share the news and the good news that um, on a piece of property that the city of Port Colborne uh, gave to Habitat for Humanity several years ago, we have the permit and we will be building a home to build an affordable housing, affordable house for a family here in Port Colborne. And we uh, had great projects and success before in the past in Port Colborne, and we look forward to, uh, to building uh, many more homes here in Port Colborne as well. So on behalf of uh, Habitat for Humanity Niagara, uh, we build strong, stronger futures together. And uh, our mission with the community is uh, to bring the community together to help families build strength, stability, independence through safe and affordable home ownership. Habitat provides people with the tools to take care of themselves and build their own futures through affordable home ownership. And I think if we can switch to the uh, next screen too as well, so perfect. So, so far in Niagara, uh, Habitat for Humanity has been in Niagara for 30 years. And so far in Niagara, we built 73 homes. We've served uh, 79 families and we do what we call buybacks. And we also do um, where we've renovated homes. We've renovated a home in, in Bell Street here in Port Coburn as well to serve a family. So we've served 272 children with sustainable, affordable housing. And I think that's the thing as a CEO that gives me the greatest pride about home ownership for Habitat for Humanity. It's about the children. It's about the children who uh, live in our homes. It's about children who feel the safety and security of having a home that their parents can afford. It's about the children who can have their friends over for sleepovers. It's a, and they don't have to be worried about moving. They can bring, make friends at school. So if they you know, attend a local school here in Port Coburn, they will attend that school right through until they're done and move on to college and university. And they don't have to have the fear and the uncertainty of moving houses, being evicted from rent because their parents own the house. And the way the Habitat Mortgage works is that the Habitat Mortgage makes it affordable for their parents so they can pay for tutoring lessons, uh, hockey, skating, dancing, any other sports, soccer, any other sports that happen. And that's the key. Really what it is about creating independence and sustainability for families so they can prosper and be a, a, a member of the community here in Port Colborne or throughout Niagara. Um, you know, we, we have something and why you see that number, it's been buybacks that we buy. We usually try to buy back the houses from the families if uh, they leave or we've bought in houses and renovate them as well. Uh, next on the screen. Perfect. So in the housing continuum, there is social housing and uh, rental housing. And social housing is something, uh, City of Port Colborne, congratulations on your project currently with uh, Port Cares. That's exciting and great, and that's a needed service. So the housing continuum is needed all the way throughout. So we have a healthy and vibrant society if we fill all these gaps and we have affordability and for all these different sustainable housing. And as you know, there's social housing, which is affordable rent, there's rental housing, and then there's affordable home ownership and market home ownership. And you know, I don't need to tell you how difficult this is getting for individuals to afford uh, housing right now. But to have all of this in place, we need social and affordable housing. We also need affordable home ownership in communities. So where families who are working, families who can qualify for mortgages, and families who can, who can get, uh, uh, get ahead, buy the house, own the house, create equity, just like the Canadian dream that we've always, everyone strives to. And Habitat, we play, uh, we're right in the middle there. We, pay, we, we, we bridge the gap between rental housing and affordable home ownership and individuals moving into market house home ownership. And we really key, so we focus on families who may, who, you know, are, are, don't qualify for traditional mortgages, can't just, they're working families, they're working families here in Port Coburn and Niagara, they, they need to qualify for a mortgage, they just can't go to a bank, just can't. It's uh, really where most of our referrals come from is banks, where banks say, hey, we have somebody that's really close, we really want to see if they can get into a house and own a house from there. Uh, we look for, you know, their, their living conditions. We, we have a selection committee, a volunteer selection committee, who looks at families who have, they look at their living conditions. They usually have to be in a poor living condition. They have to be paying uh, over, uh, you know, over what would be 30% of their income towards their rent. And they'd have to be having a hard time affording their rental property at the time. Or they're being evicted from their rental property to move into a Habitat house. Uh, our homeowners also... Uh, one key thing about this is our homeowners will volunteer 500 hours to volunteer 500 hours to help build their house. They know where the plumbing is, they know where the wiring is, they know where the uh, studs are, where all where they can put a hang a picture, or anything like that. So 500 hours in home ownership. We also sell our houses at fair market value. 
So one of the key things is we don't sell our houses, um, we don't, you know, we sell our houses at fair market value. The reason we do that is we bring the community together to help build houses. So a lot of our support comes from local businesses, municipalities like the city of Port Coburn who gave us the lot. The thing we don't want is families flipping a house, if that's the simplest term I can put it. So we sell it at fair market value. But what we do is we have to fundraise all the money before we build a house. We build the house and then we, we sell the house, we hold the mortgage. And then we hold the mortgage at 30% of their income. So every year they come in and they will, they will meet with us, we'll review what their payments will be. And that's 0% financing and zero down payment. So that's one of the biggest challenges we're seeing of young people today is getting the down payment to buy a house or afford a house. So that's how we, that's how we end up in creating the house. And this has been going on for 30 years in Niagara. It's been going on for over 50 years in, throughout the United States. It started in America, Georgia. Uh, with, an, with the Fowler family who had a dream to help people get a hand up, not a hand out, but a hand up. And Habitat has continued that home, building over 300 to 400 homes across Canada. Um, if you're next on it, so we, we, so what do families need to do? Um, families need, we, we look for families that are in better need of better housing, willing to partner with Habitat, and we have to be able to make a mortgage payment as well. So next on the screen. Um, families I've covered this off are, are selected at homeowners. They are selected through a selection committee, volunteer selection committee. They apply and then we will have the volunteer. They buy the, the home as well. So they're untitled, they own the house. After many years, if they're equity, they can sell their house or they can, when their kids go off to school, we often find, or they, to be honest, they really never sell their house. They just stay in their house because it's affordable and they love it and they stay there most of the time. Um, and we reinvest. And one of the things I want to be very clear about Habitat for Humanity is Habitat for Humanity has to, any fundraising dollars or gift in kind that a business gives Habitat for Humanity towards the build, and the mortgage money that the families are paying has to go towards building other Habitat homes. So we cannot spend the money on operations, we cannot spend the money on anything else. How do we sustain ourselves? We sustain ourselves from running the restores in St. Catharines, Fod Hill, and Grinsby. So by people donating product and the community coming together, donating products to our restores, we sell, the re we sell those products, and then those products help pay our operations. They pay our construction crews, our trucks, our tools, our staffing, our accounting, all that stuff. Just so, And we have over 300 volunteers. So this year, to, uh, to tell you, sorry, in 2023, I don't need, I mean, it's up on the screen. I don't need to speak a lot about this, but everyone knows the challenges of affordable housing that Habitat Canada. But uh, a lack of affordable housing is a top concern for many Canadians. I think that's pretty self-substantial. Um, you know, if we read through those stats, 94% of Canadians feel that the goal of owning, owning home ownership is more difficult and out of reach. 92% of Canadians across the country believe that there is a shortage of affordable housing, which I think we would all agree on. So, next screen on the... So this year, 2024, uh, we are excited and we have a five-year build plan. We are excited that um, we're currently working on two homes in Thorold. You can see the semi at the top. Uh, they will be, uh, the families will be moving in in May 16th is when the families will be moving in. We have an exciting announcement uh, about the four townhouses on Mary Street as well in Thorold. Uh, they are starting, they're going to be putting the servicing in on April 15th. We'll be doing a groundbreaking. We have a, uh, we have a great gift that's coming forward with that on uh, April 25th. And then uh, in, in May, and we'll be doing the groundbreaking in June, so We'll book your calendar, Mr. Mayor, and councillors come out. Uh, Mitchell Street in Port Coburn, the property that the city generously donated. Uh, we will start construction in June. Uh, Mitchell Street in Port Coburn just takes about six months. The family will be moving in just before Christmas to be moving in, and we'll be having build days. So next on the screen, just four families have been chosen so far. These are photos of the four families that will be moving into our houses. Port Coburn House family selection is still happening right now. The selection committee is meeting with different families. I would encourage if anyone knows a family to put an application in, and uh, there still is time, but we'll be selecting a family for the Port Coburn House. We like to keep two families that are from the Port Coburn area that may have kids in the school in the area and that too as well. So, excellent. Thank you. Uh, really what we wanted to come today to do is thank uh, the City of Port Coburn for the donation of the lot on, Mary's, on Mitchell Street as well. And uh, Chelsea will take it away to talk about uh, some of the build process and bringing the community together for the build in uh, uh, Mitchell Street, so go ahead. Okay, thank you. 
Um, so you'll see, we, uh, in order to fundraise, we have teams of six, and it's $3,000, and that's an exclusive build day for a team, whether it be corporate or a, a community group that gets together. Um, it's designed as a one-of-a-kind opportunity for these groups looking to come together for a day of home building at this construction site on Mitchell. Uh, whether your group has never swung a hammer or is already in the construction field, they can all be a part of our Habitat Build Day program while they know that they're making a difference in the lives of a local family. Your volunteer efforts combined with your financial contribution doubles the group's impact by providing the volunteer labor and finances to help us fund our home building program. Um, Mark touched on our ReStore, but just to touch again on the social enterprise and how that's also funded. All the proceeds from operations fund Habitat Niagara and help build homes in the community for those in need of a safe place to call home. 100% of cash donations help build Habitat homes. You probably already know, but there are three locations in Font Hill, Grimsby, and St. Catharines. We accept and resell new and gently used items, such as furniture, appliances, decor, and home improvement building materials. All of that goes towards um, the other part of our operation. And really, honestly, here today, I'm really honored. I really thank you for the opportunity with Mark to be able to get excited with you and um, help build a, a family, a home here in this great city. Thank you. Great, thank you. Just a few more things, how can you guys help? How can the city of Port Coburn help? You guys already have by donating land. Spread the word. Uh, any available land that the city has coming up, we always look for new land for places to build. And as you can see, we're moving into multi-unit builds. And just spread the word to come out and help. And the city of Port Coburn has been great with permit fees and helping us get the permit. So thank you. Good stuff. Council, any questions? Councilor Borgard. Through your worship to the presenter, thank you for that presentation. Uh, it was, it's nice to see and get a little bit more of an understanding of, of Habitat for Humanity. Uh, one question I have for you is just, how long did you own that property for? That's a great question. It has, so I will first start by just apologizing because we should have built on it sooner. Uh, about seven years. Um, I think it's been seven years, roughly seven or eight years at Tally Tree. We should have built on it sooner. I won't, uh, I won't uh, deny that. One of the things we looked at and said, we have to build a house in that property uh, at the time. The reasons were it was just kind of we had we had a build schedule usually we're, we're currently planning two to three years out and we always try to plan two to three years out and then when COVID hit it threw our whole entire build schedule into a bit of turmoil so coming back to it uh, we had a, a program with students learning how to build we had to put on hold during COVID and then we were able to we had to pick up the programs that the ones that we we're already working on so uh, I do apologize for that. Uh, one of the things that was very sincere to us was that we needed to build in Port Coburn at the time. Yeah, no, no doubt the uh, construction costs certainly didn't, went up quite a bit too, so I understand that. Uh, one of the things, and I'm happy to see that you're, you're entering into uh, more higher density developments, multi-units, uh, in particular for Mitchell Street, um, was there any consideration into doing a multi-unit? Because it seems like a higher density or multi-unit development, if it's permitted in the zoning, why wouldn't you do that? Because you'd get more families in. Yeah, Mid Mitchell Street is our, is our last single family lot that we have in our stock. We have land bank for the next five years. It's our last single family lot. Um, we did. Uh, Mr. Long, we had meetings with the planning department and we tried to put a semi on. Just be it was a 12 foot across semi on either side. That's as much as we could fit on. Uh, it's, it's unfortunate, we would have liked to, we really wanted to put a semi on. Um, we looked at other, if we went stacked, but then you're into kind of a, con, a condo charge who, who shovels the driveway, who maintains the grass in the backyard. Uh, we looked at all the options. Unfortunately for this property, just by its width, uh, a single family house was the best option without it being when I say 12 feet across, which was pretty small if you have three children and four children, so. Yeah. Oh. Councilor Bruno. Thank you, good to see you again, Mark. If those who don't know Mark, he was previously with the Hope Center, previous Welland counselor, so he knows his way around the chamber and he knows his way around, uh, he's got a big heart. I mean, if you start at Hope Center, people don't have anything and you move up to people trying to get a step up, so 
Congratulations, Mark, on all that you do. Um, Mark, two things that came to mind from your presentation. One was um, you talked about land banking and that you had enough. So how do we as a municipality, if we have something, want to go to Hope Center and not be in a five or six year wait? In, in, in other words, um, you know, we've sold land before, uh, raw land, and, and we've sold uh, properties. And always in our deals is you must build within two years, just so people don't land bank. And I understand your story is that you weren't land banking. But at the end of the day, um, I'm sure you want to see people in a house and you need volunteers and you need money and it's not just the land. So is there anything we can do on that end and anything we can count on from Habitat to Humanity if we decide to go right with the land and present it to you versus maybe a left Niagara housing or whatever. Could, could you explain some of that? Thank you for the kind words, Councilor Brown, and appreciate it. And it's a great question. Uh, what we would look at working with the city of Port Colborne with is that we would come up with an agreement that we would have to build within so many years, within a year, two years. We've done that before in the past. That's the best mechanism Then we're aware if there's land available that we have to build within so many years. And we're, we're changing some of the mortgaging, working with the banks a little bit. That's in the main goal behind that for Habitat is we realize the afford affordability crisis is real. It's there. We need to move faster. We need to build more units. So we are looking at building uh, six, eight units in the next years, next couple of years, 11 units, and we're looking at a possible 20 unit build. So we're looking at changing our financing model a little bit that'll still keep it affordable. But when we look at it, we're pretty much going to move in that direction because we have to build more. And we and you're right. What we're looking at with municipalities are people who are generous and give us a dis, you know discount on land and help us out. They want to see those homes right away. Nobody wants to see you know five years, six years, or this example. I'll just call it. But I totally get it. I understand it. As a as a as a city councilor, I would I wouldn't be happy with that either. So, but what we would do is come into an agreement that would say that we have to build within two years on that property. So it usually takes us about a year. You have permitting, architectural drawings. It takes about a year for all the zoning, any applications like that. But then we'd have to build within the next little while. That's how we would do it. Yeah. Okay. Just, um, Mark, on when you guys carry the mortgage, just from a city interest point of view, is the taxes rolled into that so we don't have an issue with the new homeowner? Like when he pays you the mortgage, are you paying us the taxes? Does that does that keep a better uh, close in the circle? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, it's the simplest way to answer that question. The taxes are part of the mortgage payment, and it goes directly to the cities. We take care of it. And if our homeowners because become behind on, ta on taxes paid or they miss payments, we cover the taxes for the municipality. One last one. Mark, um, you have rebuild on there, and we've seen that, the one in port on Bell Street. And so, you know, from, a, from your perspective, uh, which is sort of easier to turn around. Like if we inherit a home that's, you know, needs some work or donated to the city, um, it, is, is that a project that um, is, uh, has a quicker turnaround? Because there's already a, the bones are there and the shell is there? Yes, uh, Kelsbury, yes, it's a quicker turnaround. We're excited to do um, Renault's, uh, retrofitting. We love doing it. Won't lie to you, building new is easier. You never know what you're going to find when you open up the walls. I think we've all been there. Uh, so it starts out, starts out and they were going to make this place look nice into gutting the entire thing. So the answer to your question is it's quicker. There's more risk to a rebuild, but we will, we will adventure onto any to make more affordable housing. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Further questions? Seeing none. Mark, again, thank you. And thank you uh, for all you've done in Port Colborne and Niagara with Habitat. It's phenomenal. Look forward to this one. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, and really appreciate the support of the city, the staff, all the volunteers and residents. Thank you. Our next presentation is for the grant committee. So if I could have Councillors Hoyle and Aquilina meet me up at the podium.
So the Grant Allocation Committee meets twice a year to review applications for community grants. The grant program started 20 years ago with proceeds from the sale of Porkman Hydro to Canadian Niagara Power. There are five members of the committee, our Chair B. Kenny and our citizen member, Brenda Hames, are unable to meet with us here tonight. But myself, Councillor Aquilina and Councillor Hoyle represent uh, Council on this committee. Our committee allocates funding to local nonprofit groups and organizations based on council approved criteria. The deadline for application, the first of two rounds, was January 31st of this year. And the committee met in February to discuss the merits of the applications. Grants were allocated to five community groups and organizations. We're pleased to present checks to representatives of those groups this evening. At this time, if Councillor Aquilina can come up and make our first two presentations. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, can I call upon uh, Amanda Brett from Birchwood, please? Thank you. Amanda is the Director of Development and Stewardship for Birchway Niagara, formerly known as Women's Place. On behalf of the Grant Allocation Committee, I'm pleased to present $3,000 to help pay to shelter and Feed women and children fleeing from domestic violence. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Let's take a quick picture. May I say a few words? Yes. Yes, please. Say a yeah. few words and then we'll go over there. Um, good evening. Thank you so much. It's my absolute pleasure to be here this evening. One is a uh, resident of Port Colborne, but also as a representative for Birchway Niagara, your local shelter for women and children affected by gender-based abuse. I would like to let you know that your gift is an absolute lifeline for others. Last year, we lost 62 women uh, due to murder in Ontario, and that is an increase of 19% from the previous year. Three of, our, three of those women were here in Niagara Region. Your gift will be used to provide resources and tools for women and children to rebuild their lives so they can live a life free from abuse. Anybody looking to uh, access support, even though our shelter is in Niagara Falls, we do have outreach centers, one at the Hope Center, one at Fort Erie's Bridge Community Health Center, and one here on Thursdays from 8.30 to 4.30 at Port Cares. All of our services are free and confidential to, any, to anybody who could use them, whether they live in shelter or not. Thank you very much for building a safer community. Um, next, I'm going to call upon Halisha Gross of Port Colborne Minor Hockey. Um, can you please come forward? On behalf of the Grant Committee, I present the check for $8,000 to Port Colbert Minor Hockey to help fund qualified instruction and skill development for volunteers and players without increasing the cost to local families. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. I'll take a picture after. I was unaware I would have to speak, but I'd just <laughs> like to thank Council and the community of Port Colburn and all of our hockey families uh, for their continued support of our hockey programming and keeping it affordable for our local families um, and community. We really strive to give uh, the local families an opportunity to play hockey um, within the confines of all the bills and everything else. Um, equipment, we're always looking for ways to make it more affordable for families and this is certainly going to go uh, to help us with some of our capital projects um, for our up and coming season, which we've already started planning for. So thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Aquilina, and at this time I'll call Councillor Hoyle to do our next presentation. Will Rosemary Poisson, uh, Chair of the Downtown BA, please come forward. Uh, 
on behalf of the grant allocation committee, I'm happy to present this check for $2,000 to help the BIA uh, continue their vital art projects, local artists, and focus on the market square. Thank you. I also didn't know I'd have to speak tonight. <laughs> On behalf of the downtown BIA, we'd like to thank the city for your support. And we're going to use this to do some beautification in the market square. So the shed that's across there is going to get a beautiful mural and paint job. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Hoyle. And I'll ask Kim Eros, president of Port Coburn Optimist Club, to come forward. On behalf of the grant committee, I'm happy to present this check for $4,000 to help you and your volunteers present the Canada Day community celebration in HH Noah Lakeview Park and the Father's Day fishing tournament for children. Congratulations, you and the Optimists always do a great job for Port Coburn families. Thank you. I'm not going to shake your hand because I'm starting to sick. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, we too are trying to uh, provide an event, uh, Canada Day, that's very affordable for families. So a family could show up and they really don't have to spend any money. Uh, so we try to do as much of that as possible. And the fishing derby, we were fortunate enough last year to take over from the uh, conservation club. And uh, we have over between two to 350 kids come out. And uh, we have some great partnerships across the city for that and another great event for uh, the kids in Port Coburn. So we are really um, feel blessed that we're able to do that. Take a picture. Yep. Thanks. Hold the check up. Oh. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Our final allocation is to Mothers Against Drunk Driving, which you may know as MAD. They're unfortunately unable to join us this evening. The grant committee has allocated 2000 to MAD to fund presentations to make young people aware of the dangers of impaired driving. MAD teaches our sons and daughters and our grandchildren that impaired driving injury and death are 100% preventable. No one from MAD, I already said that. Uh, so we congratulate all our grant recipients. Uh, we thank you, uh, fellow committee members, uh, for your conscientious work allocating these important dollars. The grant policy committee will meet in July for the second of the final allocation of the grants. The deadline is June 30th, so if you do not have uh, to wait until June, you can apply right away. Just go onto the city's website or call Gail Todd in my office. The application form is at found at cityofportcoburn.ca. We're just going to take a few photos. Thank you. Okay, next is the Mayor's Report. Our Chief Administrative Officer plans to share some insight on the eclipse and how things unfolded yesterday 
but let me thank on behalf of members of council our entire team of staff for pitching in to organize roads parking activities and all to keep our city safe it was a great team effort in the days leading up to the event and all the day during the event staff really came together and i'm proud of all of you thank you very much we're not always happy when the weatherman or meteorologist uh, as i should say gets it right we all saw and heard in the days leading up to the greatest celestial event of our era that clouds could cover our view of the total eclipse of the sun the sun did poke through a few times yesterday afternoon enough to see most of the phases of the eclipse i watched with my family from sunset park near my house and we were very lucky uh, to take it all in from our backyards our parks and our beaches what an experience it was what a thrill to experience totality that sudden darkness for almost four minutes enough to say there was probably about 30 or 35 people in the park and there was a couple house parties going on uh, people that live around sunset but there was probably at least 20 kids there and as soon as it went really dark all you could hear is all the kids go wow i mean they were totally amazed it was you know second one i've seen but uh it, it doesn't it does not get old uh, friends who live in Sugarloaf Place overlooking H.H. H. Noel Lakeview Park said it was awesome to hear the cheering at the total eclipse. People have shared a range of emotions after experiencing the phenomenon. To the thousands who shared the experience with us in Port Coburn, we thank you. Business owners along the canal on West Street have said it was a very busy day. We know that uh, Pie Guys closed down early because they were sold out of everything, uh, if not busier than some days of canal days, which is incredible. And we, we uh, really appreciate everything they do for us in our business community. It's a day we'll remember until the next eclipse in 2044. It won't be in our backyard next time. We'll have to travel to Alberta to witness that one. The six members of the Mayor's Youth Advisory Committee held their first event Friday evening at the Golden Puck Room at the Valet Centre, a dance for students in grades 6 to 9. Their spring fling was a great success, and I'm proud of them all and all the work they put in to make this happen. They wrote promotional announcements for schools. They designed a poster. They secured sponsorships. They collected prizes from local businesses. They decorated the room, they made playlists for music, and they coordinated food and drinks. They recruited volunteers, and they collected 80 pounds of non-perishable food for the Reach Out Centre from around 100 guests. I'm so impressed with this group. One of the MIAC goals is to raise enough money to sponsor a family at Christmas time. The committee members are already working on their next event, a health and wellness session for students, with tips to manage stress, stress during exam time. And uh, I have to say, and, and Councillor Hoyle sits on this committee with myself, is that they were a very bright uh, group of young people. On behalf of Council, I extend thanks and congratulations to the MIAC team, Sierra Walsh-Fiore, Emma Lauer, Jenna Conturis, Sofia Sica, Maria Gonzalez, and Eva Wachel, who was recently awarded Youth Citizen of the Year by the Port Coburn Wayne Fleet Chamber of Commerce. One day, some of these six may be sitting around this table, Councillors. Um, I know Councillor Hoyle stopped by the dance uh, midway through to see how things were going. Anything to add, Councillor? Uh, it was actually sold out, in my opinion. That's good. Did you tear up any tiles on the floor or get a dance in or two? <laughs> no, I just went to check in on them. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, thanks. Yeah, cut no run. Uh, so again, we thank our MIAC team for what they're uh, doing. And uh, please keep an eye out for their next uh, events that are going to be coming up. Uh, our regional councillor, Councillor Davies, is not here this evening. Are there any regional councillor items to be brought forward? Okay. Staff remarks. CAO, anything to add other than the eclipse? Any sure. Remarks? It's for your worship. I will talk about the eclipse briefly. I do... Uh, <laughs> want to thank Councillor Bodner for bringing it to our attention all those months or over a year ago. Uh, I think what you said was actually true. We uh, did experience quite a lot of people traveling into Port Colborne. And although the weather was, I guess, a bit of a letdown, what was promised did in fact occur. There were many, all of our parking lots were full. There was grass, uh, you know, the crowds that gathered, there was space. Many, many private parking lots were full. I looked at I was mostly in the operations center, which was partially activated as an, as an emergency, but we didn't declare an emergency. But um, Tim Hortons, for example, cars parked, trunks open, telescopes and blankets out, and so on. So we did get people in droves. Fortunately, I think for us, it happened in drips, not a flood. And because of the preparation, I don't think it was in spite of the preparation, I think it was because of the preparation of the fire chief, Chief Lawson, and of Olga, who is here today, 
from recreation services and others at the city that uh, everything went off without a hitch. People were able to gather, sort of come into Port Colborne and come out of Port Colborne easily. At uh, one point in the day, the farthest people I'd heard of traveling were from Calgary, but later on in the day, I found out that there was two eclipse chasers, I guess that's a term, from Ireland, who chose Port Colborne of all places to see the eclipse and traveled all the way from there. So um, the fire chief did a great job of making sure we're prepared. I told him he didn't have to come to the council meeting tonight. Uh, this is his last day of work. Um, he is on the payroll still, but he's out of the office. And we said our goodbyes yesterday as we closed down the operations center. But I think this is a testament to the emergency preparedness that he brought to us, uh, as well as the firefighters who were on scene or uh, working yesterday or helping in advance of yesterday to prepare. Thank you. Mr. Schapowski, anything this evening? Mr. Bowles? Mr. Long? Denise? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to mention and thank everyone for attending our official plan, our first open house for the official plan we had at the end of, of March. It was a fantastic turnout. We had about 60 to 70 residents, um, landowners, consultants, et cetera, attend. It was a fantastic session. We got a lot of great feedback, uh, and we're looking forward to the, the next steps in, in, in the project. Thank you. Great, thanks. Madam Clerk, anything to add to that? No. Okay. Councillor's items. Councillor Aquilino. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to um, acknowledge uh, Chief Lawson's last day with us and to thank him for his commitment and dedication to the city and uh, wish him all the best in his new position with Niagara Falls. Thank you. Councillor Borgard. I have nothing this evening. Councillor Baggett? Oh, I'll say oh, just a little bit, Mr. Mayor. I just want to thank staff. I went around on the Eclipse Day, the Vail Center Park and that. The Vail Center was just, just terrific. The museum was there, the library. Firefighters had the best gifts for the kids. They, they were a big hit. And uh, the telescopes there, and I got a lesson from our deputy clerk on about, about the sun, and I appreciated that. <laughs> And after the, it was all over about quarter after four, I went for my try to get in shape walk, and I walked up to the park and to the marina, the promenade. I only found one little piece of garbage on the ground that whole walk I did, and I was really impressed with the people. You know, they were very respectful of the environment and stuff, and uh, plus our crews were doing a, just a terrific job, getting those signs down fast when it was all over. So thank you, staff. Councilor Bruno? And no ward issues. I'd like to echo uh, Councilor Aquilina and Councilor Baggy's thoughts. I mean, uh, I think the chief, um, uh, uh, in his tenure here, um, provided a lot of uh, continuity, and I think uh, I think we um, everything moved forward under his tutelage. I uh, uh, ditto on the staff, everything surrounding um, uh, the eclipse and the preparedness, the communication report. Um, I've heard nothing but positive things from members of the community and members of my family who, uh, who attended and their children. So uh, kudos to everybody that uh, that did that. And um, that's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor. Councillor Elliott? No. Councillor Danch? Oh, I got a bit full. Um, Got a call today from a resident on Hillcrest there with some of the truck traffic that's been going up and down, and apparently they're in the or under the impression that the trucks are supposed to be going out the opposite way to Elm Street. So I guess the trucks are all coming down Hillcrest and you know causing the mud issues and uh, the noise and whatnot. So the second time this person has called me, I, I did uh, relay to bylaw both times there, but maybe we need to make another personal touch. Um, I had one person come up to me about uh, Derrick's Point down the end of Ramey Avenue there. Maybe a little bit of cleanup could be done. I know it's springtime and, uh, you know, all that stuff starts showing up again. And then uh, on the Kalali Street Bridge, Seaway property, I, and I've said this at least twice now, uh, the garbage there is unbelievable. I mean, I know it's not the Seaway itself. It's all the people that don't realize there's garbage cans in the world. The area needs to be cleaned up. I mean, there's there's... Uh, tote boxes, there's cups, there's uh, 
half of a, a sign there, like a detour sign off to the side of the road. I don't know if somebody could get a hold of the seaway and maybe ask them if they could get one of their landscape guys to clean that up there. Is that for you, Steve? <clears throat> okay, I, I appreciate it there. I mean, I, I walk by it most mornings there, and it just doesn't seem to change. If anything, it gets worse, and I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Councillor. Mr. Schapowski is working with the Seaway on a number of issues that we have, so we'll take that to his contact with him. Great, thanks. Councillor Hoyle. To the Mayor, um, I must say uh, everything uh, for the Eclipse went uh, actually very well. I did some uh, traveling around to the Val. Uh, the beach parking was just packed. They're packed on side streets and that. Uh, even our smallest parks had people sitting in it. I don't know if anyone even went around and looked at them. For example, Johnson Street had kids and families in there. Um, I think the van went very well. Uh, I also wish uh, Chief Lawson the best. Uh, and uh, that's it. Thank you. Councillor Bodner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Through you to, uh, to Denise, um, you had talked about our public meeting for the new official plan. And... Um, and there was some concern from some Ward 4 residents that were there that the map of Ward 4 was rather light in any indication of what might be going on. Um, do you have, can you explain some of that to us? Sure, thank you. Uh, through the mayor, to the councillor, uh, we did have the, the open house, our, our first open house for the kickoff of our official plan. Uh, this is the, the very beginning of the process that will be uh, take about a year uh, to, to complete the official plan. We had a number of activities throughout uh, the council chambers that the members of the public could participate in. Uh, we had various maps where they could use sticky notes and indicate where they see residential, where do they envision commercial uses, where do they envision uh, and want to protect agricultural uses. Um, so as part of those maps, uh, we did show the, the various hamlets in Ward 4. Unfortunately, the, the map wasn't completely zoomed out uh, to show the entire Ward 4, um, but I did want to say that um, most definitely the official plan process includes the entire city. Uh, we also have a website where um, the residents can go on. If they go on the City of Port Colborne website and it says Let's Connect right on the first page and click, and click on the official plan project, there, there's an interactive map where you can zoom in and out and you can pin any comments you have. So if you envision something, uh, a specific use in a certain area, um, you envision uh, walkways in a certain area, you can pin that on the map and let us know so that we can receive that feedback. So we, the, just to, to highlight, this, this was the first session of many. Uh, we will be communicating. Everyone that provided their information that evening, we will share with them uh, future events so that they can continue to come out uh, and, and participate. Councillor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> and Denise, this is like a year-long process. So there yes, is the mayor. Yeah, that time is correct. to... Okay. Yes, we, we will have uh, various sessions throughout the development of the official plan. This first session was really just to, to go to the community and say, how do you envision the city? Where do you envision growth? Where do you want to see lands protected? So it was a kind of a clean slate um, in terms of the maps and, and what uh, the residents could, could comment on. So we didn't say, this is where we're looking at doing this, or this is where we're looking at doing that. We really went to them and said, what, how do you see the city? How do you want to see it grow? So this is going to help us inform our work plan moving forward as we retain the overall consultant to proceed with the, with the year-long project um, that most definitely will include many engagement sessions with the public. Councillor? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. One more thanks, Denise, on that. <clears throat> Just like to uh, comment a little on the Eclipse uh, Centennial Park was. <laughs> we don't have a lot of parking spots there, but they were they were all taken up uh, early, and our crew there did a a really good job. And um, I just like to compliment a couple of. Uh, enterprising young fellows that took it upon themselves to um, charge for parking in their driveway, which was at least a 
well, maybe a half a kilometer away, happened to be kind of across from my house. So, um, and so they sold four spaces in there and the people were happy to get them. And I compliment our uh, staff that was down at Centennial that suggested that this might be a possibility because a lot of people showed up there after, after um, it was full. So kudos to staff for, because the, the kids went down there and said, uh, you only got seven spots left and we're gonna have some down here, but they gotta pay for it. So, you know, can you send anybody down? And uh, it worked out good for them. So, and um, can I just ask, uh, I don't know who to ask to, but uh, the, the Eclipse glasses that are left over um, I happen to be watching a local news program and they were saving them because there's an organization that collects them and then sends them on to parts of the world that couldn't afford, you know, or may not have them. And an eclipse happens every year in some part of the world. So, um, so I didn't know whether, you know, we had some we didn't know what to do with. People still have them in their house and wondering what to do with them. Personally, I'm not saving mine till the next eclipse because I probably just won't make it, I think, at that time. But, um, but anyways, it's just a thought process. Uh, you know, if we don't know what to do with those, rather than throw them in the garbage, maybe we could uh, encourage people to gather them and, I don't know, take them to Council Bruno's house or something like that. I don't know, you know, whatever. Just, just saying. Um, and just to comment on Chief Lawson, it, it was a real privilege and a joy working with him. He was he was always receptive to uh, to everything we brought forward, and uh, and his ability to take over bylaw and uh, really kind of rework that whole situation was uh, was really good. So kudos to him. We'll miss him. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Mr. C.A.L., with regards to Eclipse glasses. Yeah, through your worship, I can work with staff to see what has not been distributed and if we want to do some kind of a roundup with the public where we can collect them back. And then we'll follow Councillor uh, Bodner's uh, direction to get those reused and recycled. Instead of going to Councillor Bruno's house, maybe Councillor Bruno can be in the Market Square Friday mornings for the next few weeks. Starting up a post office box in Iceland. Uh. <laughs> Thanks, Councillor. No further items. Uh, our first uh, item tonight is 8.1. It's the options report for short-term rental accommodations. And our planner, Ms. Landry, if you want to take this, anything to add, or do you want to take questions first? Questions. Questions first? So I do have, uh, I'll go through the councillors that have uh, put their names into staff, and then I'll go to everyone else. Councillor Bodner? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> first of all, before we start, if I could ask Denise, uh, on page four, there is a um, four paragraph um, section that deals with Shirts and Shores uh, Resort. Mm -hmm. Is there any um, thing that we're gonna vote on tonight that will, uh, so, because I usually declare conflict on that, but I wanna be able to speak to the rest of it. So. Through, through the mayor to the councillor, what we have in front of council tonight is three different options in terms of how we proceed with short-term rentals. The first option is status quo, uh, do nothing, don't change any of the regulations, um, don't impose a licensing bylaw. Uh, the, sec the second option is to enact uh, or direct staff to proceed with the process of an official plan amendment and a zoning amendment, as well as uh, bring back forward a draft licensing bylaw. And then the, the third option, and I may have mixed the two up, is uh, just, just proceeding with a licensing bylaw without um, an official plan amendment and zoning amendment. So the way that uh, we've proposed the official plan amendment and zoning amendment is we're looking at uh, the municipality as a whole and, not, uh, and, and looking at them by zones and not um, by specific areas. 
Okay, Mr. Mayor, seeing, hearing that, I'm willing to proceed with not declaring a conflict on that section. And Go ahead. To Denise, again, I understand that uh, the zoning bylaw will be coming back at a further meeting. Right? And so can I ask at that time, is there a way, if there is a, a conflict that I have with Shirkson, because I'd still like to speak on the rest of it, um, can you separate that out if it looks like it needs to be? Okay, and I'll check with the integrity commissioner before that. But uh, okay, so now to questions. <clears throat> um, one thing in there uh, that I I kind of had a problem. I do have a problem with that, actually, is that it suggested that restrictions of accessory buildings that they can't be a short-term rental. And um, I know from my experience along the lake shore, probably 50% of the homes along there were built with an accessory dwelling. Quite often at that time, it was for family. Um, they're very long lots. And I just don't see the need for restricting accessory buildings unless someone can really convince me that that is a major problem. Through the mayor to Councillor Bodner, uh, I, I hear your points. Um, I appreciate that, that comment. Um, as mentioned to you, uh, we will discuss it with our consultant uh, that's been assisting us with this project who has a lot of experience. Uh, I think the, the intent was to ensure that the residential areas, especially in the urban area, main, maintain the residential use and not um, kind of hinder on the, not becoming more commercial uses. What we can do though is, is look at that option um, to permit second dwelling units as a, a short-term accommodation in certain areas. Uh, and we can update that when we come back forward with the statutory public meeting if council directs us to proceed with a zoning amendment. The limitation on the length of stay, minimum and maximum, that'll be defined further in the next, like the zoning? Through the mayor to, to the councillor, uh, the definition we've proposed of short-term rentals is that they don't exceed uh, 28 days. Mm -hmm. uh, if council proceeds or directs us to prepare a licensing bylaw, we would put further detail on that and exactly what would be permitted. So some municipalities um, say they only allow uh, rental every three nights of, of a week so that there has to be a break in between just to kind of break up the, the more commercial use of, of the property. So we can look at uh, different avenues in terms of how we want to, to license. But yes, those specific details would make their way into a licensing bylaw. And so will we look also at the minimum so that somebody can't rent out a Saturday night to eight people for a party and a Sunday for another party, you know, something like that? Yeah, through, through the mayor to the councillor. That's definitely something uh, that we can chat about with the consultant to see um, best practices. I, I understand your point in terms of um, limiting the ability to, to only rent for one or two nights on a weekend uh, to help with um, those types of situations that might occur. So if that's something that council uh, would like us to, to include in the bylaw, we can definitely look at that and, and put that forward. And that's the end of my question, but can I make a statement on this too, uh, Mr. Mayor? Certainly. I can word it as a question if you want. But, um, so so when, I, when I first kind of kicked this off and got on it, it isn't because I don't want short-term rentals. I want a way to control the bad guys. And I think we need to see that in the next, in the zoning, however we're going to do this. There's got to be a way to pick off the people that just don't care and just stop them from being a short-term rental. So I'll just say that as a, on your next go around when it comes forward, that's what I'll be looking for. I don't know anybody else is, but thank you very much. That's it. Comment to that? Uh, no, you're okay. Sorry, next is Councillor Baggy. 
Uh, I think you mentioned Maris through you to uh, Denise. I, I also had accessory buildings and uh, the definition of what accessory building was. And from what I understand regarding penalty, that's going to come back to what the actual penalty is for uh, disregard of the rules, I guess. On uh, 2.27.1, the short term rental accommodation should only be permitted in the following zones. There's 13 zones that it's allowed. So I'm gathering the only places not allowed is industrial. Through the mayor to the councilor, the idea is that any zone that permits a residential dwelling will also permit a short term accommodation. So you are correct in that industrial zones would not predict, per, uh, permit uh, a short term, short term rental, uh, as well as any other zones that don't allow residential. Okay, thank you. I'm good, Mr. Mayor. Great, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Hoyle? Through the Mayor to Denise. Uh, my, my question is, just to clarify how the STR licensing will work for uh, uh, those who have trailers in Sherston yet rent them out, because there's some owners that just don't live there and just rent it out, and how we, this would capture it, or who's gonna be really enforcing it, because I can't see our bylaw just walking in the park and saying, hey. Slander? Th through the mayor to the councillor. So we're looking at short-term rentals, th the definition across the board, so that everyone um, is applied equally. So if, if uh, Shirkston owners are, uh, they do have a short-term rental, they are renting it out on a short-term basis uh, to occupants, then they would be required um, to, to meet our zoning bylaw. Um, as well, if council would like us to proceed with the licensing bylaw, then they would also be required uh, to get a license. In terms of exactly how we're going to enforce it, uh, what that what that would look like, um, it's something that um, Councillor Bodner had mentioned to me as well as um, our CIO, and something that we would have to sort out. Uh, perhaps it's uh, conversations with Shirkston uh, in negotiations with them in terms of maybe um, they they enforce that and, and do that work. Uh, or it's us. It's it's something that we're we're looking into to determine the kind of the best best way forward. Thank you. All set. Great. Uh, Councilor Borger. Through your worship, um, I guess I, I just had some concern in in going by it with with implementing through the zoning bylaw amendment, in that it just seems to be like an added level of bureaucracy to it. If anyone wants to change it, then they got to do a zoning bylaw amendment. Um, however, and, and well, and a zoning bylaw amendment, and that and that's quite costly. Uh, and but seeing that it is all residential zones are permitted to have an accessory dwelling, uh, sorry, um, a short term rental it is is good. That make that makes sense. I guess one circumstance that we could run into is if, say, a property is zoned industrial, or but there's a legal non conforming use of a residential use on that land. Would they have to do a zoning bylaw amendment in order to become in order to have a uh, short-term rental? Through through the mayor to the councillor, uh, yes. In that situation, they would have to apply, um, as the legal non-conforming status wouldn't um, wouldn't mean or kind of go over to the the use of a, a short-term rental. It wouldn't um, cover that. So yes, they would need that. The, the intent of having a zoning and legal non-conforming uses is that eventually those legal non-conforming uses will no longer cease, uh, will no longer exist, I should say, um, and that the, the industrial use kind of will, will take over eventually. But yes, if, if someone did have a, have a house or a dwelling and they wanted to uh, use it as a short-term rental, they would need a zoning amendment. So uh, through your worship, I, I, I feel like we can get a lot of what the intent is of of this um, regu of regulating uh, short term rentals through the one option that you presented with just the licensing. Uh, I, f I feel like this is is a, is a step further than net, that than is was required. So especially, I am concerned with what my fellow colleagues brought up with the uh, accessory buildings, not being able to have like. I, be able to have short-term uh, short rentals because that is a lot a lot of people use accessory buildings for short-term rentals and and it's added space and it provides uh, opportunity for them housing is expensive and if this is one way that uh, someone a resident can 
make some money for themselves in order to help pay their mortgage, I, I think they should be able to do that. And I don't, I think adding another level of, of red tape can really cause issues. Although, like I said, you're, you're permitting in all resi in residential uses for the most part, so that's good. I guess, I, can, can we make a change to, like, so is this zoning bylaw amendment going to come to us at another meeting? I think it was mentioned, but I just want to confirm so that we're going to be able to maybe redraft this? Yes, th through council, uh, through the mayor to the councillor. Um, the, the zoning bylaw amendment is really establishing where they're permitted and making it very clear. Right now, we don't have any regulations, uh, any definition, no direction in our zoning bylaw. They, we've simply been looking at short-term rentals as a residential use. With the zoning amendment, uh, that would require the, the owners uh, to have an additional parking space to accommodate it. Um, there would be the, the parameters that they have to, to address. So I think it, it is ideal uh, that we have it written in the zoning bylaw and made it very clear in terms of where they got permitted. Um, but most definitely, if you would um, have any suggestions for changes, then um, we definitely can take that back and we would make some changes prior to uh, having a, the statutory public meeting. So through, through your worship, I, I guess my thought would be any residential use, whether it be legal non-conforming or, or not, should be permitted to have an, uh, a short-term rental, essentially. So that's something that I would like to see. So if it's an accessory detached dwelling, then, or, assess, or, or an accessory dwelling in general, then that should be permitted as a, as a um, short-term rental space. So I guess that would be my recommendation to staff. Through the mayor to the councillor, uh, we do have consultants um, that are actually listening today just to, to hear your feedback as well that have a, a ton of experience in it. My only kind of initial thought in terms of allowing secondary um, buildings for short-term accommodations is the, the impact on the community. Uh, if, we have a lot of, if we have a lot of accessory buildings um, in a community and they're all being used for short-term rentals, we are kind of changing the fabric of the community um, to more of a commercial use. Of course, we can limit it in terms of the amount of time they can stay in terms of a, a short-term rental, but we are started starting to look at a kind of a different fabric of the community. So that was the intent of um, limiting them to second dwelling units. We could also look at uh, only allowing one short-term rental uh, within a, within a property, and it can either be within the main dwelling or in an accessory uh, building, such as a garage. Uh, so there's different options we can look at. I will chat with our consultants in terms of best practice and see what um, they found works the best and present something um, forward to council. And then of course at the statutory public meeting, um, you can take a look and if you've got further comments or, or wanna chat about it, uh, then we can, we can uh, address it then. Councilor? Just to, to worship, just about the commercial uses. Uh, it, as of right, every dwelling, residential dwelling, is permitted to have a home occupation, right? So that could also be considered a commercial use, and that's essentially the same argument. Could every dwelling could have that? So I guess I guess it could be similar. And, and I know our zoning permits home occupation, and there's some li limits to that. So in this case, a, a short-term rental w would be spelled out in the zoning. So uh, I'm. I'm fine with proceeding with, with this option and so long as we can make some, like we have a second kick at the can, I guess, to iron this out. And um, yeah, that's it. Okay, Councillor Bruno. Um, thank you, Worship. Um, thanks for the good work in getting the consultant's report. Uh, just a couple of comments and, and a question. Um, when I looked at the survey, I found it interesting that there were all kinds of comments from people who filled out the survey, and virtually all of them were anonymous. And so anonymous tells me that uh, I don't want my neighbor to know that I'm pissed off, pardon my language, because of what you did to our neighborhood or the last three Friday nights next to my nice house with this group living there. Um, the other interesting thing is um, I have been was following what Wayne Fleet did. Apparently they've had some horrendous problems out there. 
I was just talking to a counselor the other day, and I mean, they went pretty, um, pretty hard on this. So there, what they found was, to one of the things Counselor Bullergard um, commented, and I think all of us is, have this concern, is to manage this right takes a lot of resources and a lot of dollars, and that's spread out amongst taxpayers in Port Coburn. Um, Waynefleet reversed engineered how they did it. They surprisingly looked at last year, so their bylaws in force now, I think of January 1. So they found, they, they searched Verbo, uh, Airbnb, and private rentals. And what they found is, is they had 258 unique people uh, advertising, some cross-platform, but they basically went at the um, each uh, uh, each address. Uh, they hired a resource, I think it was either a retired placement or somebody with bylaw and, uh, experience, and they were going to self-fund somebody doing all of that checkup so that it didn't impact the regular staff. They're actually charging um, $1,000 to register in Wayne Fleet. And so obviously if uh, 1,000 people uh, if 258 people registered, they've had $258,000. And the fine for not registering is 5000 for the first offense, 10000 for the second, and they claim that they have worked this through AMPS so it can attach to the property. Um, while on the phone with them, he did a quick check of Port Coburn and found a little over 250 but then another Google search said over 1,000 rental properties in Port Colbert. Now, if you look at some of them, the odd ones were Bay Beach and, you know, um, what's the first road out of Port Colbert in, uh, in Waynesley. But basically, it was Port Colbert area, and it wasn't really concentrated on uh, Waynesley. It was in Port Colbert. So their view is, is that they're going to have somebody handle all this just from the fee, and it takes the load off of of all staff. Um, I don't know where they're at. I, apparently uh, only seven have registered yet as of about uh, March 1st. So whether that'll move to, um, you know, 50 or they'll have to go out and do fines, but that person's job is they're an independent contractor. They scour the internet every day, every other day. If they find a new property registered, they go down, they take a screenshot of it and they go down and see if there's a rental, and if there is, you didn't register, here's your $5,000 AMPS ticket. It, the jury's out on whether that's going to work or not. But from my point of view, um, you know, my, our responsibility, uh, at counselor's responsibility, is not to ensure that people are able to make extra income at the expense of their neighbor. I think our job is to protect the hard-earning people who have built a house. And if you have a, if you're running a proper Airbnb next door, God bless you. I don't think the neighbor cares. And you know, if if a thousand dollars and you're making ten or twelve, I don't think is out of line for us to gain control. Because I I just see that this is going to uh, just keep growing and growing, and without some proper controls and enforcement. I don't know how you keep a lid on this. And I can just imagine the amount of people that don't complain. And you got a fire service that's here tonight who is going to go to those places at 2 a.m. because there's some shenanigan going on there or a big fire. And that draws on their resources. And yet we're thinking, well, you know what? This is everywhere. I shouldn't say we're thinking this, but we're trying to do something about it. But I think we either get serious about it or you just let the free market system work and maybe there's a sweet spot in between. But I think we have to look at a way to get over however we end up policing this. The huge administrative burden that the people making money on it aren't paying a cent towards it. And uh, or they are paying a cent towards it because it's their tax dollar too, but it's disproportionate. 
And so I, I would just like to see, I'm glad we're having another kick at the can at this. I am very worried that this season is about to start and we're, you know, we're not quite in the passing lane to the, to the, to the end of the game. And, you know, are we going to lose uh, this season? What can we do anything about registration uh, and with the fee? And you know what? Probably what will happen is the bad operators might leave if they get amped out uh, or, or, or there's enforcement. And the good operators, the good neighbor, God bless them, will make some extra bucks and, and be able to, uh, to afford his house or, or do something. I, again, like many have said here, I'm not opposed to it, but you know, I'd also like to see a hotel in Port Coburn and hotels might go the way of the dodo bird, right? With, with all this short term rental stuff, but at least people should be on a relatively similar playing field. It's, it seems to me that it's stacked against the, the, uh, the good homeowner, it's stacked against the person who's running a motel or a hotel or a bed and breakfast. And I, and I just think there's, there's gotta be a way, I think the Wayne Fleet experiment will be interesting, but I think whatever we do, I think the fees gotta be commensurate with a, a dedicated person or entity that's self paid for by these fees. And then at least people also have a place to turn to. We have a place to turn to when we get that complaint. And, you know, if that requires more enforcement, then I'm sorry, but the fees got to go up. I don't, we don't have that complaint with motels or, or general homeowners. You notice you don't have that with friends and family rented. You have it when people bring somebody outside, it's eight people. You know, I know Wayne Fleet, you got to stay a week. You know, here is it, I can have eight people there Friday night and somebody can rent it Saturday and there's eight new people. Somebody rents Sunday and there's eight new people. So I'm all for regulation. I really was impressed with the survey, how most people said it did need to be regulated. Um, I'd also like to comment on the Shirks and Shores thing to, because Councilor Bodden couldn't. Um, why I think licensing works is so you have Shirkston, a business, a company, they rent out trailers. So they have a ledger, they know who did it, they know how much income came in because they're garnering the income, they're charging the HST, they're charging the mat tax. You get 400 people at Shirkston renting a private residence, you're never going to have a great job of getting the tourism tax, all those. They're all independent contractors probably half to three quarters of the deals are cash or a check. How do you track that to get mat tax? Well, you do licensing in short-term rentals. I just think there's probably got to be two plateaus. If you're at Shirkston and there's a security force and there's all these things taking care of it, then maybe it's half what it is in town. But, but then the onus is on them also to clean up anything that, that's going wrong out there. I just think that um, that uh, we need to get our skates on and get this done fast. And I don't know if you can add to anything about the timelines going forward. Through, through the mayor to the councillor, uh, in terms of timelines, if if council directed us to, to proceed with the official plan amendment and zoning amendment, um, our intent was to, to bring it back um, fairly quickly. In terms of the licensing bylaw and the implementation of that, uh, that part is, is, is quite a bit more work and there needs to be more internal conversations in terms of how we're gonna be proceeding um, with, with enforcement and uh, amps and fines, et cetera. So we will be having those conversations, but at least in terms of, of the planning piece, uh, we can move that forward while we're also working, working on the licensing um, bylaw in, in the short term. Councilor? So is it fair to say we're going to lose this summer season? Uh, through the mayor to the to the councillor, in, in terms of timing, uh, and perhaps giving giving those owners um, kind of a ample time to, to apply for their license, um, become aware of the need for a license, et cetera, it, it's possible that uh, we would not be ready uh, for the season. So is, is there an opportunity for you to put a, a sort of deadline that's workable for yourself? Because if we're going to lose this season, I'm happy to uh, 
stand down and let internal staff handle it. What I've experienced is when we've tried to do official plans by ourselves without consultants, this is going way back before your time, um, you know, we had all good intentions to save money to do it. But this, I think, needs to be up and ready. And if that needs extra resources, whether that's overtime, whether that's um, seconding somebody, whether that's uh, getting someone in to do that, I think we should front the money, get it done, and build that into cost recovery and the fee. So if we're out 60,000 to put this package together, we've got to try and recoup 60 and we're going to put some enforcement in it. That's going to be, you know, part of how we get that money back. But I just I'm really worried that if we try to do it on our own, on our own with all the other pressures all in your department, all the other development uh, uh, applications that you're dealing with, you know, I, I don't want to be sitting here in December and then saying, well, we probably should have maybe got something and now we're behind the eight ball and we're under the gun. So from my point of view, if you can't do it, put your hand up soon, go for the OP and zoning, but let's get on with it. If we have to front it, let's do that, recover the money, and at least we have something we can be proud of. And I think we have, I mean, the one benefit of being slow off the mark on this is we're going to have some uh, intel on what happens around us. So I don't know, I, I'd be for putting that motion forward if you need it with respect to OP and zoning. I don't know if that's what you're looking for tonight. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I can, uh, Mr. Mayor, I can yep. comment on that and through the mayor to Councilor Bruno. Um, we do have a consultant um, assisting us with the project. Um, they've been working on the zoning uh, and official plan amendment with us as well as uh, they are drafting right now a licensing bylaw for us. Uh, so we do intend on bringing it back as soon as possible. That being said, uh, in terms of the timing exactly and, and when, um, when we can start requiring people to get a license, that is kind of the, the trickier piece, but we can do everything um, possible to, to get in front of council as soon as possible. Thank you. Could you come back and investigate with that consultant and your staff as to a time frame, and then we can make a judgment call on whether to uh, further go outside or put some more resources on it? Yeah, through the mayor to the council. Yeah, I can provide an update at uh, the next council meeting. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you Councilor, Councilor Aquilina. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and I appreciate Denise and uh, David Schultz meeting with Councilor Bodner and I on Friday to discuss um, some of our concerns, which uh, Councilor Bodner brought up. And thank you to, to both Councilor Hoyle and, and Bruno for bringing up Shirkston Shores. I am. I was concerned that um, they were being bypassed. Uh, you, you did reassure me that they were not and that um, residents had the option of coming um, to the public meeting to speak. The one concern I do have is similar to Councillor Bruno is um, by law having the manpower to enforce and especially enforce inside Shirkston Shores, um, but outside as well. And then um, the licensing, like I think you mentioned in the report that there would be uh, funding for a position for the licensing. Um, so I'd, I'd like maybe in the next report to, to have a little bit more detail around that. I'm just afraid that we're gonna be a little short staffed when it comes to really pushing for this. Okay, Councillor Elliott. All my questions were answered through that uh, <laughs> meandering conversation, so I'm so, good. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Bodner. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Just a really great uh, conversation on this. Thanks, everybody. Um, uh, one one thing that I didn't hear anything about, and and it'll probably come up in the in the zoning. What is the point system or the possibility of a point system? And I know early on we talked about that because Fort Erie, I think, still has that in progress. Uh, you know, you, you're a short-term rental, you get 20 points. Every time there's a complaint, legitimate complaint, and it has different scale, you lose a point or two points or five points, and eventually you lose your license. So. So that gets people interested uh, and they start to pay attention. 
but I understand there might be some uh, hesitancy about bringing a point system in. So if it turns out that a point system isn't in there, I want to know what the option is and why you ruled out the points. Okay? It, it may not be the best, but that's my simple mind says you got 20 points, you lose it, you're out of business. Take a hike. So, anyways, just want to make sure that that's explained in there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Further questions to Ms. Landry? Seeing none, so the recommendation that Development and Legislative Services Department Planning Division Report 2024 25 be received for information. That the council approve the regulation of short term rental accommodations via the combined licensing and official plan zoning bylaw amendment outlined in option three. And that the acting city clerk be directed to schedule a statutory public meeting to review the proposed official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment. Questions to that? Comments? Anything? All in favor? That's carried. Item 8.2 is recommendation report for zoning bylaw and official plan amendments D09-05-23 and D14-10-23174 Mitchell Street. I have Councillor Bruno. Thank you, Richard, through you um, to the author. Um, the only concern I had with this was that um, the cost recovery should be done on this property for the removal of all city services back to the main. So, you know, it's not going to be used as a building lot and to have a lateral there for water and wastewater seems to be redundant and an invitation for the thing to age out and leak and we won't know it. So let's remove it and the person should pay for it. The other, I think, so that may be for between Mr. Schapowski and in planning. Can that be put in? Do I need a motion, an amendment, or further discussion on that? Let's get them to answer your question first. Yep. So, Mr. Schapowski. Uh, yes, uh, through your worship. So we would be able to remove those lines back to the mains um, per council's direction for that. So not a motion, just direction. Um, the second question is to Ms. Landry. Um, the zoning is going to remain R4 on an empty lot that's not buildable, that's for a parking lot. So why is it still R4? Because it needs something? I, where I'm going with this, I don't want somebody to come by 15 years later when we're not here and say, I want to build a house on it, it's got R4, and uh, we start this all over, and everybody forgot about um, uh, 174 Mitchell and the owner's gone and we're all gone and you know what why can't you build a house there um, maybe can but you should go through a process um, and does that detach it from Mitchell Street uh, I can I can fill that one through you uh, Mr. Mayor and Councillor Bruno um, so the provision for having parking on a on a side property like this is already baked into our zoning bylaw so uh, in essence you don't really need to change the full zone of the property the reason that it's part of the application is because special provisions were being requested um so in essence the the actual zoning of the property doesn't need to change because parking is already allowed on there so just finally so when we're all gone and somebody um wants to sell um 174 mitchell street will there be a way will it be on title that it attaches itself to 174 mitchell for parking uh through the mayor yes it'll be uh they'll be linked together through the site plan agreement that's all I have, but if, if you need that motion for direction or, or not with respect to adding that to the uh, uh, approval process. I don't know if it's added at the building permit, if it's a bill now, if it's added to the, through planning, Mr. Mayor, Mr. whatever. I can, I can feel that one too. I did speak to our, uh, our development supervisor. We can, we can also tie that into the, uh, the site plan agreement as well. All right, we'll take it as a direction. Yeah. You're fine with that? Good, thanks. Councillor Hoyle. Uh, through the mayor, um, Councillor already <laughs> uh, 
took some of my questions, so I'm just going to close by, I hope to see more of this happening to our vacant buildings yeah. and get them filled, build, revitalize them in the future. And thank you for asking my question. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Further questions, councillors? Seeing none, if I can have Councillor Bruno and Hoyle move. Sorry, let me bring it back up. The Planning and Legislative Services Department Report 2024-91 be received at the bylaw to adopt amendment number 15 to the official plan for the City of Port Colborne, attached as Appendix A, be approved. That the bylaw to amend zoning bylaw 6575-30-18 for the lands legally known as part of lots 15 and 16 on plan 849, municipally known as 174 Mitchell Street, and the lands known as lot 26 and plan 19 on the northeast corner of Nickel and Mitchell Street, formerly in the township of Humberstone, now in the city of Port Coburn, regional municipality of Niagara, and approved or be approved, and that the acting city clerk be directed to issue the notices of adoption and passing in accordance with the Planning Act. All in favor? That's carried. Oh, just on item 8-1, it was Councillors Bodner and Baggy that moved that. Just to make sure you guys know. Item 8.3, encroachment fees for pop-up patios 2024-38. I have Councillors Bruno and Hoyle. Councillor Bruno. Uh, thank you, during the day. Questions asked and answered, I'll withdraw. Councillor Hoyle. Uh, to the Mayor, I received a question from some businesses, so I'm just clarifying. Uh, does the focus pertain solely on canal days, or is this going to be during the whole season we do patios? So someone can answer that. Yep, Mr. Cotton. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Hoyle. So I guess it depends on what you mean by focus. But um, are you return? Are you re are you referring to the the um, activations that they do? Or are you referring to the fact that they can have their their fees waived for canal days and for throughout the year? Canal days and throughout the year. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> yeah. So this is pertaining to both of them. So they can have their encroachment fees and their canal day fees uh, waived uh, through through this uh, through this report thank you further questions recommendation the chief administrative office report 2024-38 be received that the bylaw attached as appendix a being bylaw to amend bylaw 6665-29-19 being a bylaw to adopt policy for encroachments on municipal property be approved all of councillors uh, Bruno and Hoyle move that. All in favor? It's carried. Item 8.4 Nickel Beach Parking and Related Operations 2024 um, for the year 2024 and report 2024 22. Um, Councillor Bruno. Uh, thank you, Worship. Through you to either Luke or, or Greg, who's ever going to answer this uh, uh, report. Uh, one of the things I noticed in the port that I that I, I didn't like, um, I, I think we started the change at Nickel Beach to make it more of a family friendly place. And now I, I see because some people have said, well, you know, I want to bring my pet to the beach and walk my dog on the beach doesn't necessarily rise to me to the attention that it should happen because somebody asked or a bunch of people have asked. I think, you know, if you want to have potentially a dog area uh, at the far end, that could work. But, you know, you've, you've seen what's happened with uh, very some sad circumstances in the last two weeks in Ontario, in, Ontario in, in Alberta with uh with with a dog and a, and a child and i'm not so sure that people really that are beach goers or have their little kids at the beach notwithstanding they're supposed to be on a leash notwithstanding you gotta have somebody make sure they're on a leash notwithstanding you gotta then go find the guard at the beach to do that i'm just i, I don't i think we should either pull people or make a certain area but i'm I'm dead set against uh, pets at the beach. 
I just think it's a family thing, and I think things can easily get out of control from cleanup after them and from in and around families and kids. So I don't know um, what either motivated that, because it's sort of anecdotal and not how many people wanted it, but do you see the possibility of setting up a separate area then? Uh, through you, Mayor, to Councillor Bruno. Uh, so we have looked at uh, different beaches in the area. Uh, so uh, we've looked at uh, St. Catharines, Lakeside Beach, Sunset Beach, uh, Jones Beach, um, and that's where we saw different uh, models where we did have uh, leashed pets uh, allowed on the beach, but we also did see for Reeves Bay, Bay Beach, where they we wouldn't have dogs there. So uh, the model that uh, you're talking to, uh, Wasaga Beach has a similar model where there's a certain designated area uh, where they would be permitted uh, to have dogs uh, and then another area where uh, might be better suitable for families and one up to go as well. So. Councillor? Uh, thank you. I, was, I paid particular attention to Bay Beach, which has, is near us and a lot of attractions. And I think if, you know, I, I don't want to... Uh, <laughs> um, if you can't have a dog on the beach at Bay Beach, come to Nickel. You know, I don't want that to be our strap line. Uh, and so are you, um, I guess I should ask uh, through you to the mayor or the clerk, would that require a motion to change? You'd have to make an amendment to take that out, okay. yes. Right. Um, before Joel, well, once, let once, me go around. Once it's on the floor. The yeah, once it's on the floor. So it's not on the floor yet. Yep. We're here for questions. So okay. once I put the rec recommendation on the floor, that's when you would amend it. Great. Good. Thank you. Um, I think that's it. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Baggett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I got a few items here. Uh, why do we need to keep the beach open till 9 p.m.? Mr. Rowe? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Baggu. Um, those were the, I guess, our, our beach hours of operation that were determined last year when we're like, undergoing the changes that we've, we've seen at the beach. Um, those were the times that, I guess, staff felt um, it was appropriate to keep, keep it open to. I know we do have, um, throughout the beach season, we do have folks that are staying till close to that time. It, it's a, sort of a regular duty our beach students have is is you know as we get close to that nine o'clock in closing time they're going out and reminding folks that it's it's time to go and the gates are going to be locked so we definitely have um you know folks who remain there to that time or close to that time so um yeah that's the only feedback i can provide to you mr mayor um i thought our regulations used to be sunrise or sunset or something like that or was that a couple years ago through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Bagu, I, I don't know off the top of my head what our previous um, hours of operation are. I'm sort of new to this beach um, managing team as of last year slash this year, so I can get that information and uh, report back. Thank I can you. take it past 9 o'clock some nights. Yeah. Remember that. <laughs> Early if you get an eclipse. Yeah. Uh, another question, Mr. Mayor. Um, at Thanksgiving, we have the month of uh, October, and of September, October. We still stay open until nine o'clock. Those dates also. Luke, um, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Bagu. So during our uh, fall hours, I believe it was seven o'clock uh, that we would lock the gates. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, got a couple more questions. In the report, you're talking about enhanced beach amenities, a new accessible washroom. What's wrong with the one we got? It's brand, wasn't that brand new? Luke? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Bagu. So I, I believe that section of the report, that was, in, that was sort of an overview of what uh, changes and upgrades we had brought uh, the previous year. So our accessible washrooms um, are the same that we had on the site last year. The one, I guess, Thing is we'll have our ramps uh, installed for the entire beach season whereas last year they weren't um, they weren't fully uh, built and designed until midway through the season so so maybe that's what that's referring to okay mr mayor i'll be short thank you uh, there's talk about having cameras at the entrance basically what i'm concerned about there's a lot of people that go for walks early in the mornings and i know when the uh, the guy with the big inflatables out there 
we don't have the gate opened up because of potential of somebody getting in there and doing some damage. But once they leave the, once they remove the, uh, I don't even know what you call it, hop along or whatever you call it, jump a thing, um, the gate is left open for citizens to go for a walk early in the mornings. Is that still going to be happening? Luke? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Bagu. Um, so the the man gate, I think that's what you're referring to. So that throughout our our summer operations, that gets locked um, every day uh, after 9 p.m. So it gets unlocked at seven, locked at nine. That happens before Splashtown Niagara opens, and it will continue to be the case after they close um, until Labor Day. Uh, and the reason for that is just due to the the infrastructure we have on site. Um, leaving that gate open, I think would leave it as vulnerable there and risk potential vandalism and damage to those uh, trailers and washroom units. Mr. Mayor, permit one more question? Certainly. Oh, thank you, sir. Um, you're talking about moving all parking permits to the honk system. And uh, what did we do last year? We Look. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Bagu. So last year we had our zones two and zone three, the extension of zone two uh, through Honk. Um, that was all of the parking that you would come, you know, you'd scan the sign, you would pay on site. You did have the option to go ahead and book in advance if you want, but it wasn't very common in that scenario. And then our zone one parking lot was done through um, a separate platform called Audience View because of the nature of people wanting to book in advance. So we, um, we thought it made more sense to have everything go through Honk Mobile, so you can still have that all the same capabilities we had last year. You can purchase a ticket in advance through Honk, or if there's space available in the Zone 1 parking lot, you can also purchase um, on-site when you arrive, which wasn't quite as easy with Audience View. So, Honk, so adding everything under one um, software, I think, will make it a more user-friendly um, experience for customers and, and easier on an administrative level as well. And Centennial Beach also had more than just the honk. Did they have the cash also or no? Luke? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, no, it was all through Honk Mobile last year. Okay, I'm good, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. I have Councillor Hoyle next. To the Mayor, to uh, Luke. Uh, just a few questions just to confirm that um, because, well, you know, our friends on social media. Uh, the plan is to convert the uh, parking area along Lake Street into a designated walkway, painted, uh, separated by a boundary, and nice paved side. We're not going to pave right. Fix the shoulders of the, the stone shoulders. Look. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Hoyle. Yes, that's correct. Um, we, you know, fielded some complaints last year just due to um, the safety of some folks walking along that roadway, roadway while cars were parked along the shoulder. So we feel it is best to eliminate those parking spots, create a designated walkway. So there would be, uh, you know, our proposal is to have uh, painted lines along the edge of the roadway, um, bullards installed every two meters. Um, so then the shoulder, which is gravel, will act as that walkway down to Nickel Beach. So. We do perform annual maintenance grading um, and leveling out that that uh, gravel walkway, and we'll make sure that it's done in, in any times throughout the year when it needs to be fixed or um, you know or remaintained. We'll make sure that happens. When it comes to uh, staffing, with the um, uh, increased time frame that we're going to put into uh, Thanksgiving, I know most students are gone by September. Uh, are we just going to re relocate staff? Maybe that's Steve. To you. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Hoyle. So we saw last year um, during the week in this extended period, it's it's relatively quiet. But when we had nice weather on weekends is when we had some traffic down at Nickel Beach. So, um, you know, we're just looking at having it passively um, maintained like we would at HH Knoll Park. You know, the gates will be unlocked. At opening, locked at closing, washroom facilities will be open, garbage will be collected, that sort of thing. Um, we do have a number of local students um, that we were able to utilize last year on weekends. So when 
we do have the beach open on those weekends and we have uh, more levels of traffic, we have uh, staff on site to address the needs that we have throughout the summertime. Councillor? Mary, I just have a few more. Um, the biggest thing last year was the seaweed, as, seaweed, as you know, right? And uh, I know that was an issue with the splash, you know, with their events and the beach in general. Do we have a more consistent plan this year? I believe we have permits to do it in a timely manner. Luke? Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Hoyle. So we, we do have our Nickel Beach operational plan that, you know, we work um, through and it's signed off by the MECP. So in that plan, we're actually not able to remove any seaweed or algae that is in the water or is wet on the shoreline um, that we would be in, I guess, in violation doing so. So the only time we can remove seaweed is when it is dried and on land. Um, and in that event, we have our beach staff who are able to, to remove. And if it is, you know, to the effect that we need assistance, we can uh, draw on our friends from Public Works to help with that. Councillor? Last question, is there any update on the uh, security cameras that the uh, beach, the parking lots would all, well, I believe we're already supposed to have done or in the process of being done? Brian? Uh, through the mayor to council, um, the security company that we had worked with and thought we had to deal with, um, they had a mechanism to report into the NRP system and that was part of the requirement. Um, they've identified now that that system, there's a, there's a breakdown, so that's not, that won't happen. We will have cameras up there, but they may not connect to the NRP at this point in time, and there'll be test cameras, and then we'll look to switch out to NRP connections once we get that work. But just for clarity for Council, they may not connect directly to the NRP at first. Councillor? Oh. Further questions? Councillor Bodner. Thank you. Hi, Greg and Luke. Um, just to pick up on Councillor Bagu's question on Centennial Cedar Bay, it says here that um, staff also recommends moving Centennial Cedar Bay parking permit purchasing to Honk Mobile. But did I hear you say it was already there last year? Luke? <coughs> Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Bodner, I may have given you false information. I'll double check and report back. Um, that was my understanding, but um, I'll clarify that. Okay, uh, that's okay. Uh, it's going to be done, that's for okay. sure. Um, so that won't, so people just, because I've never used it, so they, you just go on there and reserve your spot. And but there still be a staff person in that parking lot to make sure people don't park in the wrong spot. Is that true? Um, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Council Bonner, no, uh, Centennial Cedar Bay Beach is, is not a staffed beach like Nickel Beach. Oh, the beach, yeah, but I mean the parking lot itself. Um, no, it's it's uh, I guess a self like a self sufficient parking lot. <laughs> it's monitored by bylaw. Yeah. Right. So I'm just thinking somebody comes, they think they got a spot, they pull in, the thing's full, they're going to start hauling cars out of there because I've got my spot. I'm just logistics. I just yeah. don't know how that works. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Bodner. So that is uh, a parking lot where you would you would purchase your parking permit on site upon arrival. Um, so if you, you know, if you were to per if you were to show uh, arrive and there the parking lot was full, then you uh, you wouldn't have already purchased a, a parking permit for it. Okay. Um. <laughs> I can add something as well. Okay, uh, Councilor Bonner. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, Councilor uh, Bonner. Uh, so there will be signage where there is a QR code. Uh, at the parking lot on site where uh, individuals arriving and th this is uh, typical to other parking lots and, and beaches where uh, you just bring your phone up to the sign, uh, the QR code, and that brings you uh, to the lot that you're in to be able to purchase and, and pay for the parking spaces. Okay, so no extra honking out there. So that's all. 
Just because if you read the War Four rules, you can't honk unless you're a Canada goose. So we don't want a lot of honking out around Centennial. So I'm sure it'll all work out fine. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Elliott. <laughs> thank, thank you, Mayor. Um, just a couple quick questions. With the removal of the parking on Lake Road, um, obviously it'll be safer for people to walk in through the, from the parking lots. Will that accommodate a drop-off area where people can pull up to the gate and drop people off with all their belongings and leave? Is that part of the reason why that was done? Gentlemen? Uh, through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Elliott, yes, that uh, was part of the plan is to allow for a drop-off area uh, for families to drop off and then uh, go to Zone 2, then uh, to park in that area. Okay, perfect. Can we make sure that we really publicize that so people know so there's no complaints about walking from far away and bringing everything up just so that everybody knows in advance of getting there um, one other question hang on one second I get back to it so that I don't uh, uh, on appendix B Nickel Beach parking rates and fees down at the bottom it says beach fines Reckless driving environmental impact is two hundred and fifty dollars. Can you explain that? What's reckless driving? Is that on the beach or is that on the road? Ryan, uh, through the mayor to council, I can help out with that. That that fee actually came out um, when you could still park on the beach and we didn't remove it because we know you're still they can people can still drive within the parkland because as soon as you move past the house that's on lake road you actually enter onto parkland still so it was thought best for now just to leave the fee and we'll see how it goes we have the kiss and ride in that and this way if council if we do have an issue council does have the ability staff have the ability to issue a ticket if we're going to issue a ticket on that I don't know, but that is that was left um, as a carryover from being able to drive on the beach, and it was left simply because uh, you're still you're still driving on parkland. Okay, is that like Highway Traffic Act, or is that under what jurisdiction is that? Through your worship to uh, Councilor, I think it's the fact that it doesn't have status. As a road, once you get past that point, it's under our own bylaw. So that, that the Highway Traffic Act would not apply. So the bylaw does apply in the absence of that. So the authority for the ticket is the bylaw. Okay. Um, and the environmental impact at 250, what's, what's that? So uh, through the mayor to council, if our lease agreement with uh, Valet Health and with Valet actually has a requirement um, with respect to our responsibility to the, the beach location. And that area that we're parking in is actually um, a part of the lease agreement. So if somebody was to move, for example, a car out there and it was to have some sort of impact leakage or that we would ultimately be taking on the responsibility for cleanup in that um, it may not be the um, it, it was established a couple years ago as a mechanism to recognize that that risk existed um, happy to take any feedback with respect to how that was developed a couple years ago so somebody has an oil leak in their car that drips onto the parking lot if we give them a ticket is that what that means through through the mayor to the councillor and council that that could be how it gets applied okay I, I'm just trying to rationalize that from my mind how we're gonna have staff hand out tickets for two hundred and fifty dollars at staff discretion you may have some upset people if you say that was reckless driving and your car has a leak so we're giving you a 250 dollars fine um i think we want to reconsider those i don't know if that i, I 
I've never heard of an environmental ticket before where your car has a leak and you get a $250 ticket for it. I don't know if anybody would be aware of that. I don't know if people even were aware that their car had a leak. So, I mean, those are some issues you might want to take a look at going into the season before we stand, start handing out tickets because some people may not know what, uh, what they're up against. Just my thoughts. Okay, further questions? Councilor Aquilina. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just have a, a couple of questions. Um, so to tag on to Councillor Bodner's um, with the Honk app, I, I did bring this forward, I think, before we opened last season, where my concern was with the app, like you had mentioned, if people book ahead of time, what's the linkage um, to bylaw to to know or to the staff that's monitoring the beach that somebody has a, a spot reserved. Like if, if, if people are coming from St. Catherine, say, or Welland, booking ahead of time a spot at the beach and other people are, are attending in the meantime before they get there and put their phone up to the QR code, is it gonna say the parking lot's full um, is there a linkage to bylaw that's going to, you know, give all the license plates that are registered so that those people aren't getting tickets? Like, I'm, I'm trying to get the connection there. Luke? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor echoing it. Yeah, so the, um, the Zone 1 parking lot, so if, you know, you can purchase your spot online in advance only if, uh, so we have X amount of spots, only those X amount of spots can be sold. So if somebody you know, arrives at the beach and there's four spots open and they go to scan, you know, the Hawk Mobile sign. If they haven't pre-purchased their ticket, it will say this parking lot is full, um, you know, parking not available or whatever the message is. So if somebody were to then park, they would be in violation and our Hawk or our um, bylaw staff, they have access to, um, you know, the back end of Hawk Mobile so they can see exactly which license plates are registered. Our beach staff as well have uh, the ability to do that so if somebody does arrive and they say they had you know purchased a spot but there's no open sp uh, spots available our staff can then go in and, and they can determine who might be parking uh, illegally I guess you could say. Perfect thank you. Um, next question is last year I, I know we were still building the parking lot and the signage wasn't very big so I'm assuming new signage is there where it's clear with the, it's not the eight by 11 paper that was on the post before. Greg? Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councilor Aquilina. So uh, as a part of the, the beach planning and the off season, uh, we have been in discussion with the, the communications team and uh, talking about signage uh, in regards to um, more clear and more permanent, like not paper uh, posted uh, signage out at uh, out at Nickel Beach and, and the beaches is, is uh, part of the plan and the discussions that we've been having. Okay, thank you. And one last question. Um, I know that you have rental uh, for toys and, and lounge chairs. Is there any um, thought of having um, accessible wheelchairs that can go out on the beach at all at the at nickel luke through you mr mayor to council Aquilina. so we do have uh we do have one it's called the moby chair so that is available for people who um who require um you know that to, to get down to the beach we also have accessible beach mats that we install um so that gives you a straight line um towards the water from the concrete path or the asphalt path Okay, thank you very much. I'm done. Councilor Bruno. Um, thank you, Worship. Just going to circle around on two things that hasn't been raised. I wanted to see what everyone else had to contribute to this. Through you to Mr. Bowles, maybe, on this one. Um, what does it... I think we've done a good job with Canal Days to be able to explain to the public that, you know, for the average house in Port Coburn, it's $20 or less to run Canal Days. Because I'd like to get away from, uh, I'd like to get to a point where, like Canal Days, 
We have the committee, we trust the staff reports, they refine things every year. You're in your infancy here. You know, there's not a lot of financials here. In fact, it's void of financials from last year. So I look at this thing, you know, <coughs> truth, truth be known, I should, you know, what did, what did running Nickel Beach cost last year and what does that equate per household at Port Colburn? Mr. Bowles? Through the mayor to the councillor, uh, we did, uh, when we were doing the budget, give forward our forecast and then the year end, uh, I think, results come out in a couple weeks uh, with respect to it. But I have the figure, um, revenue was about 160000 uh, last year. Uh, the direct operating expenses um, for last year were $200,000. So um, the actual incremental cost of running it, the direct cost was 40000 But then when you look at insurance and the other costs that you tally it up, the total cost for the beach was about 130000 uh, in a deficit. So for the two years previous when we were parking on the beach, we ran surpluses. Uh, Pre-COVID, we had deficits uh, on, the, on the beach. Um, so from a dollar perspective, I guess $130,000 uh, would be less than around $10 uh, per, per household. Why I'm going there is because, uh, you know, people have all impressions of whether we should charge, not charge, how much we should charge, it keeps coming back, did we make money, did we lose money? You know, beach business is a tough business. It's worse than being a farmer. You gotta depend on the weather, right? You're not gonna score every year and the, the numbers are gonna go like this. I'd like to get to a point where taxpayers know that, you know what, it's $15 or less, it runs Nickel Beach. Some years it's in a surplus. I think this is for a broader conversation, maybe at, butter, at budget time. But you know, if you make 30,000, you know, put 30,000 in a rainy day account, put 30,000 for capital improvements, grow the business, and, and don't be way out of whack that year with the weather craps out on you. And could we have some better uh, numbers? Like I look at this and I say, so you're taking 26 parking spots out of the first area there because it's supposed to be unsafe and cars get scratched and all that stuff. Like, but those 26 parking spots paid one of the higher rates. So like, do we know, and if we don't, let's know next year, um, what those zones make us. So if you eliminate 26 parking spots at a high rate, if you take, if you go from $20 on a weekday to 15, if they have a splashdown pass, Notwithstanding, I know we want to grow that business and they pay us a fee. So you discount that five bucks. On the weekends, you're discounting it $10 for parking if you do that. So there's a bunch of stories here that is we're not going to take this revenue. We're going to lower these two revenue accounts. Um, how do you see that play out for 2024? Are we going to have much better marketing? Do we think we've got some of the parking problems solved and the kiss and go that are going to improve things? So I'm hoping that, you know, we didn't have a great year last year. We're showing some areas that we're going to take away revenue accounts. How do we now bridge that gap and get us back closer to where we want to be? Both. Uh, through the mayor to the councillor and council, I appreciate um, how the councillor put it, how you see it playing out because I don't have necessarily a crystal ball and last year was our first year with the uh, uh, parking uh, situation as it was. Um, but I, I think you hit on a couple of key things. We do have the reserve, which we've identified in the report and we will be using that. Um, it's within our reserve policy to extend some marketing. Last year we didn't go deeply into marketing and I think council's aware of that. And the reason we didn't is primarily because it took some time to get the, uh, the the parking lot put together and then we had the complexity with respect to the weather for a big part of the year so it was a difficult uh, i think first year with where the parking lot was um, w when we look at it playing out yes you're correct we're taking out 26 spots and i think if somebody does the math it's somewhere just over if you were to sell every single spot um, on friday saturday and sunday which is our biggest time uh, you'll see that maybe we're short or we lose about $20,000 in revenue, the differential between a cheaper fee and a higher fee. 
But I think from staff's perspective, what we put forward to council and maybe how we uh, potentially see it playing out is because of the safety, because of the kiss and ride, because of the accessible washrooms, because of the additional uh, items that our manager of uh, recreation and uh, coordinator of the beach and events has pointed out, um, we think that the, the real play here or how we see it playing out is we're expanding the opportunity for people to come in the other lot, zone two and moving into zone three. And if they feel safe to walk those 300 meters, we can expand through our marketing, through our promotion, people's interest to come to zone two and zone three. So yes, we might lose 26, but the goal is to replace it with much more than 26, to, to, to replace it with more people that want to come to Port Colborne and hopefully come to the downtown afterwards and visit our uh, businesses, whether it be in the downtown or in the downtown on Main Street. So um, I guess we don't have that crystal ball, but what we do know is that by providing a safe environment, um, we are able to go out and communicate uh, I think the great experience you're going to have at the beach and we hope to report that it works out and people can come out to uh, zone two and zone three and we can fill those um, going into uh, this beach season. Councilor? Have through this year better data collection so that next year when we want to ask these questions about what did this, how did this affect things, how did that affect things, we can do that because I would love to give staff the support to run with taking new opportunities and new chances. I think it's healthy to try some new things. And I don't want to be here, you know, with a stick next year that why didn't it work and yada, yada, yada. My goal is to ensure that if that upside cap can be sustained because of your innovative ideas, and a year from now or year after, we're saying, you know what? If, if running that beach costs between 10 and $15 a household and Canal Days cost $20 or less, I think that's a small investment for what it does. If I or my family can go there and grandchildren all year round free and it's clear and some outsiders helping to subsidize that, for $10 for my family to use the beach every day free is good value. So I'm for that, but I don't think we have these kind of parameters there that, the, that us and the public can say, yeah, go at it. You're the experts, you're there every day. Um, experiment with this, try that, but stay within that realm of, of 10 to $15 a household. Then I think, yeah, because this isn't just about making money. It, it's a, about experience in Port Coburn and our residents. So, if you can assure those parameters, if you can make sure that we have better data points for next year, and um, that, then I'm happy to uh, have some uh, uh, run room here on this. I, I question some of the, um, I mean, this is maybe a small point, but, you know, when in my trade, like, you know, weekends are the busiest, but I understand you want Splashtown to be success, but when you knock off $5 on parking on the weekdays and $10 on parking on the weekends, to me, that's counterintuitive to um, dynamic pricing. More people are coming on the weekend, we're packed more on the weekend, and we're giving a bigger discount. My way of viewing things is you want more people there on the slow days and to make it exciting, but I'm not going to belabor it. Um, but I just think um, I think we need some better data, some better. There was a lot of questions tonight, which I think could be a, a sign that we need better report writing on this one. But uh, uh, that's all I have for now. If we're going to do the recommendation, I'll add the issue about uh, pets, Mr. Mayor. I'm done. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Any further questions? All right, the recommendation is that Corporate Services Department Report 2024-22 be received and the Council approve consolidating all parking permits and season passes to Honk Mobile. The Council approve redesignating the 26 parking spaces along Lake Road from the Zone 1 parking classification to a no parking area zone. The Council approve applying line painting and installing flexible, flexible bollards. 
as depicted in option one of Appendix C, Long Lake Road between Zone 1 and Zone 2. Council approve updating the current posted speed limit from 20 kilometers to 10 kilometers. The Council approve discounted parking of $15 on weekdays and $20 on weekends in Zone 2 for beachgoers who present proof of purchase of a Splash Town Pass. The Council approve Nickel Beach to align with bylaw 5503-100-10. The Council approved the extension of beach operations from closing after Labor Day to closing after Thanksgiving weekend. If I could have Councillors Bruno and Bagu move that. Councillor Bruno. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, I'd just like to add a, an amendment that rather than the uh, uh, pets allowed on the beach, that there be a, a pet zone um, for owners who want to go to the beach with their dog. I prefer the far end, but I'll leave that for staff to decide. Thank you. We got a second to that? Councillor Bodner, questions to the amendment? Councillor Danch. And I'm not a dog owner, but that dog is still going to be on a leash or is it going to be running around? No, it'll still be a leash, but in a dog zone. Thank you. Okay, correct? Dog zone? Yeah. We can call it that? All right, any further questions to the amendment? Okay, I'll call the question on the amendment. All those in favor? Let's carry. Okay, back to the motion as amended. Any further questions? All in favor? That's carried. Great job, guys. Thank you. Now to item 8.7, as it was brought forward first. Yeah, we moved it around earlier. So this is with regards to our infrastructure needs study. Um, the Public Works Department report 2024-51 be received. I'll move that after that recommendation. And we'll have Mr. Shapowski give us a presentation. Steve? Hi, good evening, uh, Council. So we're here tonight with uh, infrastructure needs study report. Um, it's a report that we've been working on over the last couple of years. And during that time, Council actually set some strategic planning goals as well. So um, what staff has done is taken the recommendations from the infrastructure needs study and actually modified them to ensure that we're going to be meeting or setting a path to meet Council's strategic planning goals. So um, basically tonight what we're going to do is we're going to do a slight overview of the INS and, um, and then we're going to jump into some of the sections that are clearly delineated throughout the report and then we'll finish off with the recommendation. So starting off we always like to um, reference back to alignment with the strategic plan. Um, so the infrastructure needs study has um, uh, massive components to it from the infrastructure side. So environment and climate change, economic prosperity, and sustainable and resilient infrastructure are three of the, the, high, um, the high topics that we start looking at. And um, so the primary goal of the INS was to collect existing network data and complete condition assessments and provide analysis on that data and then provide an actual roadmap for staff. Sorry, you can go two slides now. <laughs> One more. Yeah, one more. There we go. Um, so we're going to jump right into the road section. Uh, there are four sections that we've lumped together within this area that are all encompassing the transportation, being bridges and culverts, guide rails, sidewalks, and roads. Uh, the first one we're going to start off with is bridges and culverts. So um, the city of Port Culver does have two bridges and 26 culvert structures. Um, so those are larger diameter culverts than you would typically see within a ditch and they're mandated to be inspected on a biannual basis through the Ontario Structural Inspection Manual. Um, so after an inspection of all of these entities, there was um, a bridge condi condition index rating score that was assigned to each structure. Uh, it's basically rated from 0 to 100 with 100 being the best. Um, our bridges and culverts ended up ranging from 31 to 98 with an average BCI of 67. So 
uh, councils basically set a, a strategic planning goal to have all of these assets at a 41 BCI or greater. Um, so with the multi-year plan that we've actually put in place, uh, we're confident that staff will be able to meet those goals for council. Um, and that'll be over a one to five year needs that we're putting together. A portion of that has already been funded through other capital requests. So staff aren't recommending any kind of monetary um, need at this time right now, but could see further ones at um, the actual budget submission time. Uh, moving on to guide rails, so the, the city has approximately 4,500 meters of guide rail. Um, there was a, a full inspection that was completed on them, with a, and they were also rated section by section. Um, approximately 190 meters of guide rail was flagged for immediate repair, and 140 meters was flagged for replacement over the next three to five years. So staff have um, already started working at replacing these sections, and they have been funded through previous programs. So similar to the bridges, uh, staff were working in tandem along the INS as we were getting recommendations to make sure that we were trying to move forward as fast as possible for repairs of this nature. Okay. Um, next we have uh, 98 kilometers worth of sidewalks within the city of Port Colburn. Uh, when we did our assessments on there, we actually went through and we had a company, they assessed every single block panel by panel and uh, there were about 6,000 defects that were found. Now, 91% of those were very minor in nature. So when we say minor, it could be cracking within a panel or it could be spalling that's happening on top. So not necessarily a trip hazard, but something that is different from a typical normal um, sidewalk panel. So the city's already been started, already started taking uh, action on the major defects, so that extra 9% to complete and that will be completed out of the annual capital sidewalk budget. Now moving on to the road network. So we have 235 kilometers worth of roads and similar to bridges, roadways are assessed from um, uh, uh, pavement condition index, which is a PCI. And it's also rated from zero to 100 with 100 being a newly paved roadway. Um, so when we assess the roadways, the surface roadway, uh, hard surface roadway is about 74.3 PCI and for gravel roadways it was 71.2 PCI. So council has set a strategic planning goal for the city's roadway to have a, a rating of 35 or greater by 2030. Um, and the road review has established that council has actually met this goal already. So the trick now is maintaining that 35 going forward. Go to the next one. So this is um, just an overview of how we actually looked at the long-term repairs and um, recommendations to make to council tonight. Um, so we looked at four different options. One was doing nothing, which you'll see as the red line that's slightly going down to a 43 PCI. And then um, we also looked at maintaining the current PCI, which is that 74. Um, to, in order to do that, Council would have to approximately double the budget that's happening at this time. Um, we also looked at maintaining the current budget and then adding an extra 20% year by year. That slightly lowers the PCI rating to just 69, so it's not too far off, and it's only a 20% increase year by year. And then the fourth option was the unlimited budget where council can put as much money as possible to keep the best roads. So the unlimited budget and do nothing aren't really uh, they're good information to have, but they're not necessarily the best uh, path forward for municipal municipality to maintain the roadways. So we did um, look at the two options of maintaining the existing PCI and then also uh, maintaining the current budget. And what uh, staff is recommending to council is to maintain the current budget, which is the most economical standpoint, and then increase by a 20% ratio. So we're not, we're not uh, asking for any money on this tonight, but we will be bringing it forward within the 2025 capital budgets for council's approval. And then we can move on to the water section. So the city owns 112 uh, kilometers of water main along with associated uh, hydrants, meters, valves, and also two bulk water stations. Okay. And here you'll see two maps that we put together um, based on information that we collected over time. So the one on the left is water main material. 
the one on the right is water main condition. And what I wanted to highlight to Council was that if you look on the water main material on the left, you see all the blue sections that are actually cast iron pipe. They correlate very, very closely to the water main condition on the right, which are all red sections. So what we've done is when we're doing our modeling for the water main replacement programs, we are targeting cast iron pipe within the system, and that's going to take that very poor condition rating out and extend it above. And we'll show that on the next slide. So just running in tandem, we are going to move to some recommendations, but just to give Council an understanding of how we looked at it, um, Council's strategic plan goal was to have all water assets to have a remaining asset life of 20% or greater by 2040. So what we've done is we modeled out all the very poor to 2040, as you can see here by the thick red line. So as that starts dropping off to 2040, you can start seeing how the other condition categories adapt to that as well. So in order to meet that goal of having all those very poor categorized water mains, the cost is going to be 96 million over that period of time. Um, okay, we can move to the next one. Oh, the one thing I will call out is just the last point there. We do have a current growth related capital water main projects flagged at 46 million. What that is, is um, in discussion with our planning division, that's all new developments that could potentially come online that have shown interest in Port Colburn. So in order to accommodate those, there would be growth costs that are associated for about $46 million worth of water main projects. Now that would also be over time as new development comes online and uh, developers could be paying portions for all of that as well. Um, so what we're going to do to top or uh, finish off each section is go through just a recommendation section for each individual water, wastewater, and storm. Um, and then we've also broken it down into data collection and study categories and uh, capital projects and then operating budget requests. So the first one we have is the water master plan. Um, so this is one of the, this will actually add a little bit more to our modeling on the, um, the condition asset side. So when we were talking about 96 million before to replace those assets, once we do some further condition ratings, we might actually see that there's less cost associated with that, right? Because we're adding more information, we're learning more, and we're understanding how our system's operating and how we get to that, um, out of that very poor condition category. So that's gonna do that. We're also gonna look at some district metering uh, within the system to see if that's feasible within the system for Port Colburn. And uh, we also want to introduce some artificial intelligence for uh, leak det detection systems. So basically what that would do is it would insert devices on the system on water valves or hydrants, and then we'd be able to um, analyze the system to create a baseline, and then we'd be able to pick out any anomalies at the time so that we can react faster to any leaks that may be happening or pressure differences. Um, again, we have uh, satellite imagery on there too, so that's exactly how it sounds. It's collecting satellite imagery and having a third party assess it, and um, they can actually find chlorinated water underground. So it's another methodology to try to find any kind of leaks that may be in the system. And for capital projects, we're recommending that the 25 and 26 uh, projects move forward with geotechnical and design and that's to be able to get a leg up so we always have one extra project just behind us in case there's funding opportunities that may come up upon us. So um, we are recommending that those happen and then in each section we have an operating budget where we're recommending that $30,000 be carried for subject matter experts to help staff just expedite these projects because there is a lot that's happening at each time and those would be presented in the 2025 operating budget. Perfect. Now we're just going to move on to wastewater. So overall, the city has 90 kilometers of wastewater mains that transfer sewage to the region's uh, treatment plant. And as council knows, we do have um, uh, challenging circumstances in Port Colburn, living on Lake Erie, and also having a canal run straight through the middle of the city. So we do have inflow and infiltration issues. Okay. Um, just to highlight some of the projects that we're currently working on, there, um, and one I wanted to actually pull out was the Pollution Prevention Control Plan. So that's essentially Council's master plan of the wastewater system. So um, everything that we're doing is kind of tying into that overall master plan, and all these projects are actually guiding our decisions moving forward. Okay. 
Uh, this one is some data that we ended up getting from all the information that was uh, collected through CCTV work and also flow monitoring. So the difference between infiltration and inflow is that infiltration might be any kind of uh, groundwater that's entering the system through cracks or displaced joints, where inflow would be more towards sump pumps or rain leaders or downspouts that are actually contributing to the, the sanitary system. So there's two different avenues of how the water is getting into the system, which means we need to treat it in two separate ways. So this is why we break them out separately, and you'll see that the dark red areas are actually the worst areas that we're seeing in the city. So those are the ones that we're actually prioritizing to make get the best return on council's investment. And uh, just so moving on to the data collection and studies, uh, we are recommending that a wet weather management program be initiated. This will do a lot of research on private property. Um, so it'll have field investigations, smoke and dye testing, uh, foundation inspections, and also include public engagement at the same time. Uh, flow monitoring, sewer CTV, CCTV, uh, citywide maintenance hole scans. Those, will, those are all um, aspects that will combine and add information to our existing systems. Um, and then sewer lateral launches is, uh, is the same. That's going to add information from the main lines to people's homes and basically see if there's any inflow or infiltration that's happening in the system. We are proposing that as a three-year program um, that we would concentrate on the priority areas first and then move on to the next priorities once those are repaired. And tying that in is the capital projects where, we, where we're suggesting that a 2025 maintenance hole and lateral rehab program would take place. Now those are still unknown costs at that time, but we would end up populating the workload based off the sewer lateral launches and maintenance hole scans that we would have it happen in 2024. So coming back in 25, we would suggest those capital projects with a more uh, price that's reflective of what we find to date, where this is based off of some knowledge that we have on the system, but it's not gonna be 100% accurate right now. Uh, with the operating budget, we are looking at a wet weather management system. So this is different from the data collection and study. This would be a year by year wet weather management program. We currently have $50,000 funded, which is mostly used for CCTV work, uh, but we do wanna have do more CCTV work and flow monitoring within the system so that we can start feeding uh, all of our systems uh, GIS systems and understanding what's happening in this system. Uh, also looking at new developments that are coming online. And as we start repairing sanitary sewers, we want to go back and actually track what's been done so that we can report back to council to show that there's a difference. Um, the one that you'll see that's different here than the others is the hydraulic modeling services. So we are going to suggest that we have uh, extra uh, costs carried to be able to complete those services which are basically updating our GIS systems and all pipe models to be able to reflect the new information that we find on an annual basis. And just touching on growth projects, the estimated growth projects that came forward from the INS was $59 million. And again, that's for new developments coming online. We'll move on to stormwater. So the city owns and operates 105 kilometers of storm sewer mains. Now, some of these sewers are designed and some are not designed. You can actually see this in this image where green is designed systems and the pink are non-designed systems. Okay. So the storm system's a little different. When we started the INS, full asset information wasn't actually there. So it wasn't similar to the sanitary system where we had a lot more information and a model already happening. But council did approve a 2024 uh, storm sewer inventory cleaning and condition assessment. So that's currently ongoing now and planned for completion in November. So one of the recommendations that you'll see once we get to it is that we are recommending that a master plan be completed. So what's that good, what that's going to do is take all of that information that we're collecting today within GIS and put it into a master plan model and also build an all pipe model for the storm system, which we don't currently have. Um, with that, we do have two other uh, projects that are ongoing right now, which is the storm outfall backflow control, which is the inspection of all the storm sewer outfalls that we have within the city, uh, mainly within the canal and the lake side. Um, and coastal engineering review. So the coastal engineering review is basically going to assess the, uh, the lake shore to determine if there's anything else that we may need to do to be able to make sure that our outlets are protected and not silting in consistently. 
for the recommendations I mentioned already about the master plan. Um, for capital projects, the, we have a placeholder for backflow implementation. So after we finish the inspection this year, we are anticipating that we would come back with any repairs or new entities that are needed to, for the system. We also have the disaster mitigation and adaptation funding, which we're still waiting approval for. And we have Clarence and Olga Street, which came with some issues in late 2023. So we're currently working through some design phases at this time. And that'll come back to council with some reports and recommendations with cost to repair those areas. Um, we also have a flow monitoring similar to the sanitary sewer on the storm system, which will help build our models in the future. Growth projects for the storm system were just over $13 million. And now just on to our recommendation. So the recommendation that we have is that uh, the water, wastewater and storm sewer projects outlined in table one of the financial section of this report be approved and funded through, from the city's capital reserves. So this chart is included within the report. It outlines all the 2024 aspects that we wanna move on in 2024 so that we can continue with construction projects in 2025. And I just wanted to thank Council for your continued support through this. I know um, they're not easy decisions to make. There's a lot of work that needs to happen to get these systems to where they need to be. And um, we're confident we'll be able to help Council meet their goals. Thank you. Steve, thank you. Uh, questions, I'll go to uh, the list first. So we're on 8-7, Councilor Bruno. Thank you, Steve. Great report. I know we received a lot of this along the way. Just one question. <laughs> Um, like in roads, um, where you talk about a 20% increase annually to get it to that number, all of these numbers that we've seen tonight, whether they be in water, wastewater, storm, sewer, or roads, um, have a dollar figure next to them. Uh, they're all not going to be done overnight. But those dollar figures, like for example, the 20% the, uh, increase every year to get to 1.28, sorry, to get to uh, the uh, required number for roads. Your numbers, um, do they include construction cost index? Do they include inflation? Through you, Your Worship. <clears throat> so these uh, numbers to date that were projected, so that it say that 96 million for water, those are in today's dollars. So those don't accommodate costs over time. Um, but what we've done is talking with finance, we've actually built it into the system where we're accounting for that over time, over time to be able to replace the right amount of pipes. So when you're looking at the infrastructure needs study as a whole, it is referencing as a dollar to date, but staff have taken that information and adapted it for a year over year, accommodating construction index um, and inflation, I believe at 5% per year is what we've, uh, we've assumed at this point. Yeah. So in theory, the the um, getting to the right number in roads with 20% a year, you know, is sort of five years, but it may be six years when you add in inflation along the way, or five and a half or whatever. Yeah, three year worship, yes. Great, thank you, that's all I have. Okay, Councillor, um, Councillor Baggio. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you. Uh, Steve, you talk about bridges and culverts. Right now, I know we got three dams in Park Culver. How are they under infrastructure? Like, I don't, are they under something else altogether? Because I never hear you mention like the Schofield Dam or the one Big Shore Road East or the one at the end of Weaver Road. Yeah. Steve? Yeah, through your worship. So, um, so although we have two bridges and 26 large diameter culverts, the Ontario Structural Inspection Manual actually states that those um, those structures are to be with a span over three meters. So those are the ones that are always inspected on a biannual basis, but not necessarily all of them are there. So different dams like the the wood, like at, um, some of the outlets, they don't necessarily convey any kind of vehicles, um, so they wouldn't be flagged within that. Uh, the Lakeshore Bridge, Lakeshore Road East Bridge, that has a, a, a gate at it, that is included as one of the bridge structures that we have. Anything that would be a driveway culvert or a small diameter road cross culvert it wouldn't be um, completed within that inspection because it's not mandated to be completed with it. Councillor? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, but these dams still are inspected quite a few times per year, right? 
Yes, through your worship, we do have inspections that take place on all of the municipal drain outlets consistently. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Brett. You mentioned a uh, couple of projects, North Crescent, Ash Street, Jefferson, Schofield, and Hampton. And I know the answer to this question, but just for other people that don't know, these streets are not picked because they're in a certain section of town. These streets are picked because the need is, I guess, critical. Yep, through your worship. So um, basically what we've done is let the data talk for us. Um, so when we throw it through our model, uh, it flags off of age, condition type, material. Um, we're all, we've also assigned fire flow testing with it, and we've also assigned break data. So each segment of pipe has break data associated with it, and through that model, it flags exactly which pipes should be done. Now that may vary year to year as we talk for, with our water department and try to figure out what they're actually seeing on, on a year by year basis. So we may adapt over time, but we are letting that data speak for itself and going to those areas because they're flagging the highest need at this time. Thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I did receive a call actually about three weeks ago on somebody on Kent Street talking about the uh, the canal flapper valve status, and now I see you have in June 2024 backflow control. Does that mean these backflow valves on the canal are all getting inspected, or does this mean somebody's going to look over and say, yeah, they're still there? Steve? Yes, through you, Your Worship. So, um, so that project is to inspect all of those, make sure that the flat beats are functioning correctly and there's no issues, they're still present. Um, but we are anticipating that work may be required. So when we do that, we are going to more than likely be coming back to Council with a recommendation for any repairs or replacements that may need, be needed. It was my impression to... Uh Oh, probably four years ago, they said they actually have to send a diver down these holes to do the close-up inspection and see, make sure it's watertight or whatever. So, is, is that uh, how it works? Yep, through your worship. There might be um, different areas where we can actually use a rover, so it could be automated. But there are some sections that may require a diver to enter into the pipes, depending on the circumstances. Uh, thank you. Uh, last question, Mr. Mayor. 2024 stormwater master plan. You're gathering all this data for all these stormwater, the water, the sewer. This is all going to come back to council, all these master plans this year? Uh, through your worship, so not necessarily this year. I don't want to get you too excited. Uh, they will start immediately. Uh, the goal is the pollution prevention control plan, which is the wastewater master plan that council will have. Um, that'll be completed this year. The water and uh, storm sewer would start taking place immediately and then we would actually join them so that we marry them up together and they're speaking together so as we need certain aspects of pipes replaced on certain areas they're going to start aligning each other which is the best bet for council and then we need to basically get on a five-year rotation to update those master plans uh, just a comment mr mayor it's great to see staff keeping on the bandwagon and uh Eventually our rates are going to go down with the city and our, our taxpayers and we are paying for the 60 or 70 years before this mm -hmm. that work was not done and uh, somebody has to pay for it so I don't want to leave for my grandchildren so we're starting. Thank you. Thank you Councillor. Councillor Borgart. Through your worship to Mr. Shpowski, uh just want to say thank you for the presentation. It was very informative. Lots of figures and information to digest. Um, one of the things I'm, I'm just wondering, is this report going to be on our website? Through your worship, yes, it will be. Okay, like in the water, wastewater section, I'm assuming? Yeah. Correct. Um, through your worship, just one question. Do, does the city have any combined storm and sanitary uh, systems? Through your worship, no, we do not. All right, that's all my questions, thanks. Thank you, Council. Further questions? Seeing none, as uh, stated earlier, there was an addendum to this. So the recommendation that Public Works Report 2024-51 be received, and that the water, wastewater, and storm sewer projects outlined in Table 1 of the financial section of this report be approved and funded from the city's 
capital reserves. Further questions? All in favor? That's carried. Oh, I need a mover and seconder. Sorry, I said that twice tonight. Uh, so Bruno and Baggin, uh, you were the first two that came up. So item 8.5 is the water financial plan of 2024 dash or uh, report 2024-88. Uh, who's taking this one? There we go. So questions with regards to 8.5. Councilor Borger. Uh, through your worship, I haven't been able to see the addendum that's with it. I'm not sure if any other, other councils are having that issue at all, but I don't know what is being requested, I suppose. We're going to put it on the screen here. So, for your worship to that, Councillor Beauregard, we do have it on the city's website. It was published. It's not showing up in the council e scribes for some reason, but it is in the forward facing documents. It was published at lunchtime. And it, what is a paragraph is added to each recommendation, uh, 8 5 and 8 7, because they were published without those paragraphs on, sat on Thursday. And then, so the only change, there's no change to the body of the report. There is one additional paragraph in each of 8.5, the one that was just approved, and 8.7's recommendation. For 8.7, the report that's before you now, it's simply that staff be directed to post this on the website, which is a provincial requirement. So it's something we have to do. We're just getting your direction for Cassandra and staff to go ahead and do that. Okay. Councillor Baggett. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, um this report, it's, it's a lengthy report. It's, it's heavy duty reading. I'm not in the best mood to read it uh, over the weekend. <laughs> Anyways, um, <coughs> this plan excludes growth projects or projections for the city. Like, why would we do that when we're having a growth related $46 million infrastructure put into our system, but we exclude it? you know, these, the growth were dated in this other report. Go ahead. Th through the mayor to the councilor and council, it, it goes back to the theory of who pays for the growth. So this report is talking about our current system and how do we maintain our current system. And when we come to growth, uh, council will be entertaining a new development charge model to pay for the growth, as well as when you look at uh, agreements that happen with developers, because developers will end up paying for a big portion of that growth. It's very possible that as some of the growth comes in, we will have to entertain it on the tax levy because it may not be paid for between the two of them. Uh, but at this point in time, we also identify in the report that we didn't include it because that component is not forecastable at this point in time because we don't know when that growth actually hits but when it does we'll update the uh, forecast councillor uh thank you do you sir so i read this report right we're going to replace 37 percent of the water distribution with plans to replace over 50 kilometers of water main piping by the year 2033 is, is that did i read this right staff Yes, through you, Your Worship. Yes, that is correct. Okay, that's uh, great news. Uh, one other item, Mr. Mayor. This report has to go to the government tomorrow, it was due. So it has to pass council tonight in order to meet, not be late for tomorrow. So maybe next time we can bring it a little bit earlier to council, like even a month, I'd be happy. You know, I know it's in a couple of years from now, but Leave it till the day before it's due. If uh, I gotta admit, I didn't read the whole report, all those numbers, the negative numbers, the positive ones. It, it was heavy duty for me. So I, I rely on this guy over here to do that. So uh, thank you for the report and uh, good luck. Thank you, Councilor. Further questions? 
Okay, recommendations that Public Works Department Report 2024-88 be received and that the Procurement Water Distribution System Financial Plan in Appendix A of Public Works Department Report 2024-88 be approved. That the Director of Public Works be authorized to submit the Procurement Water Distribution System Financial Plan and Council Resolution to the Ministry of the Environment, Conservation and Parks and the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing as prescribed and that staff make the Port Colborne Water Distribution System Financial Plan available and advertise its availability as prescribed by Ontario Regulation 453-07. If I could have Councillors Baggio and Beauregard move that. Further questions? All in favour? That's carried. Item 8.6 is Lockheed Gateway Park uh, PRIP funding application. I have Councillor Bruno. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, just a question with respect to so in this report. It seems to say to me for the first time we've now made or staff has made the decision in the funding plan that I, that the uh, current uh, <coughs> pavilion is going to be rehabilitated and the cost as opposed to replaced or removed. Have I got that right? Uh, through you, Your Worship. Um, so we haven't made that decision quite yet. What we are going to be doing is bringing the Lock 8 Master Plan back to Council in May, and uh, that's when that decision will be made. Um, there is the opportunity to apply for the application at this time to do the restoration, um, but we don't have time to wait until May to be able to do that. So that's the only reason why we're putting it before Council tonight, to make that recommendation to apply for the pavilion at the same time. Uh, we haven't made that decision that it's going to stay or be removed, though that will be up to Council when we present that master plan. Thank you, Steve, for that clarification. I guess the reason I asked is it looked like the application would fund 50% of the overall cost, and we used the number that came in for rehabilitation. So if we had put in the number for a new one, would we still get 50% dollars? And then if we did rehabilitate, we would have that larger sum of money that maybe, yeah, I don't know if you can move that around. In other words, don't you ask for the grant in the worst case scenario so that you get 50% of it? And then if you don't have the worst case scenario, you, you got some cash. So that's why I was wondering, you use the lower number on the pavilion when, I don't know, could we use the higher number and, and hope for 50 cent dollars? Steve? <coughs> Joe? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I know what you're, I, I do understand the question. I, I think with the numbers that we've received for cost estimates for re, rehab and whatnot, um, they are pretty high. Um, I think right now, if we were to get fifty cent dollars for the for the estimate that we provided, I think it would be a um, a, a huge win. Um, so at this time, I, I don't know the difference between a brand new one. It depends if you're you're replacing like for like. And I think at this point, what we do know is what the the estimated cost is to rehabilitate what we have, and then trying to come up with a new design and put new features in that we just don't know what that would look like. We just don't think that. Um, we would do that at this time. Councillor? I'm sorry, Joe. I thought I read that it was, uh, I forget the number, I can't find it this fast, but it was restoration of pavilion estimated cost at 70. Is it here? Yeah. yeah. Uh, for the new one? I thought there was a higher number just on the pavilion part. Um, but, but I guess I'm still, I mean, oh, there it is, 150, right? Yeah. So if you put the 150 in and you don't need it, can you move the money around? Because you just got an extra $75,000 and you ended up doing rehabbing at 70. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure you could find use in that park for 
for, for the other 70. I mean, I'd just like to, I'd, I'd like to take a chance. I mean, whenever I can get a 50 cent dollar, I, I want to take it all day long for all the capital work that you need. And, and we have a quote on it. So let's put it in. Joe? Uh, three, Mr. Mayor. Um, that is correct. I, I definitely, we did separate the two applications um, and we're hoping that we do get that. And I think um, we could use the, the uh, replacement cost of 150 and we can update that. So can we do that tonight? Yeah. Yep. Directly Great. you can. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Councillor Hoyle. To the mayor, uh, to Steve or Joe, uh, I have no issue with going after the funding. That's great. Go after it. However, I think I have reached out to Steve on this. Is I'm a little leery or caution because the CUA actually owns the property. We do not own the, any of that property. And are we venturing in a new kind of agreement with them before we do this major upgrade in the future. Dave? Yeah, through you, your worship. So uh, it's definitely something that staff's uh, considered too at the same time. And uh, as we start moving through with the Lock 8 master plan, that is where we'll be discussing some longer term leases with the Seaway and we'll be able to report back to council with that. Okay, thank you. Councilor Danch. Yeah, I'm just gonna echo on that pavilion uh, I know this came up several months back and I questioned the cost of it then and I still question the cost of it now. I understand you're just doing the application and uh, you know moving forward, that's a great idea. Uh, I know the Main Street BIA has been a little bit involved that my wife and I actually sat in with one of the meetings with that, Eliza and that. But uh, like go for it, I mean uh, I, I, don't, I don't see the 70,000 being the correct amount, but I know there's other plans for that park, so hopefully we can get that money and uh, improve our park for everybody. All set. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions? Recommendations that Public Works Department Report 2024-67 be received and that Council authorize staff to prepare and submit applications for the 2024 Public Realm Investment Program, the PRIP. The total estimated cost of, and you should be adding the seventy-five thousand to that, correct? Is that a total of one hundred and fifty. Yes. Oh, is it eighty? Uh, I think we estimated seventy, and the new one. Oh, sorry. Is it yeah. one hundred and fifty? Yeah. So that'd be eighty, Mr. Mayor. So add add eighty to the two hundred and sixty. Okay. Yep. All right. You're you're fine with that. You're all right with that with that direction, Madam Clerk. You're fine with that. You'll update that number in the report. Um, if I could have councillors uh, Bruno and Hoyle move that. Further questions? All in favor? That's carried. Okay, item 8.8 .8 is the Shared Services Committee Membership 2024-95 recommendation that Chief Administrative Officer Report 2024-95 be received for information that the Acting City Clerk be directed to collaborate with the Clerk of the Township of Wainfleet to schedule a joint closed session meeting for both councils to discuss the details of sharing fire administrative services that the composition of the Joint Shared Services Committee for the City of Port Coburn and Township of Wainfleet be addressed at the joint closed session meeting and that the chief administrative officer be directed to present an update regarding the joint closed session meeting including the composition of the joint shared services committee and the outcome discussion on sharing fire administrative services to a future open session of council we have two delegations this evening uh, we have mike radzikowski if i could have mike come up And just press the red button mic, name and address, please. Uh, my name is Mike Radzikowski. I live at 30 Knoll Street. 
so I'm here today to kind of continue on from the special meeting on March 19th. Um, from then, I've kind of done some more homework and research to look more into this shared service model. Uh, so I, I know I have 10 minutes. I have a lot of information. You can see my binder. I don't have a laptop or anything. I go old school. Um, so I have a lot of information that I want to try and relay. So I may not cover everything in the 10 minutes. So I, I really encourage council members, if they have questions of what I bring up, to, to ask the questions. Because, uh, again, like I may not hit everything. So, again, I've gone through, I've looked at um, other shared services, other fire departments within Ontario. So I've able to go through and I've located uh, some of the departments where it's kind of worked and hasn't worked. So I'm going to go through a couple of these places that have looked at it. So the first one I'm going to talk about is Huntsville and Lake of Bays. So what they've done there is they started out in a shared service agreement with the fire chief, just like we're considering. With that, they had uh, councils and reports go forward. They've done a fire master plan. And at the end of the day with that, what they're kind of looking at is, again, it really only going to work when they become consolidated into one department. Uh, some of the things that it says in here is a single fire service level needs to be set for both municipalities to realize many opportunities for greater efficiency. Setting a single service level for both municipalities could be inefficient in staff needed to move back and forth between both municipal, municipal councils on many occasions to align council priorities. Um, once the terms of reference for the governance and oversight committee is adopted by both councils, the committee's first priority would be to establish a single service level for the blended fire service. This level of service uh, would be recommendations of the governance and oversight committee to both municipal councils. So what they've done and they're uh, working on is having a committee between the two councils to work together to make this one level service within their municipality. Again, they're referencing saying that with one fire chief doing both municipalities, it's the workload to answer to two councils, two policies, procedures, two di different cities is, is too much for one chief to do. So they're kind of joining the uh, committee to overview and they're going to report back to their councils as this is put together. So that, that is one example of where they've looked at the shared, started with the shared uh, chief model or administration, and then they've worked towards making it, they're working on making it one department. Uh, the next one, which I've kind of already described back in, uh, on March 19th, was Grimsby Lincoln. They were at the same, uh, I provided the reports. Again, I can provide, I didn't put it as part of the, the agenda tonight because there's probably over 300 pages here for you to go through, and I'm sure you all didn't want to sit there. It's already a lengthy night and, and uh, agenda for tonight, so you probably didn't want to go through 300 pages to try to read to this. But I'm more than happy to send them to you, just to kind of get off topic here, to send it to you so you have review, or further discuss with you at, at, at future um, options if, if that's available. So the, the Grimsby-Lincoln one, I did provide that one in that report on that night. I'm not sure if, if anybody had a read of that or not, but again, going through that, that uh, municipality and what they've done, they hired uh, or went through the reporting system. Uh, and when those reports went back to council after it was um, reviewed, again, so some of the administrative outlines that they had, again, fire chief reports to two separate municipalities, uh, two councils, two CAOs, and posed a challenging uh, and results in frequent scheduling conflicts. Uh, the fire chief participates uh, in two corporate leadership teams, which also poses result uh, poses challenges and results in frequent scheduling conflicts. Uh, so the challenges with blending and aligning two separate independent administrators with different processes, policies, procedures, as well as two completely separate IT infrastructures and records management system will uh, with little to no interoperability. So what their recommendation was adoption of a fully integrated fire service it sets out in the shared service agreement beyond the pilot project, what they were attempting there, would allow the implementation of effective remedies to address most of the transitional challenges that are currently being faced. Operating as a single fully integrated cohesive department, I said this before, right, common operating systems, uh, processes, processes with significantly enhanced effectiveness and efficiency of the shared fire service in, in uh, those uh, municipalities. 
and provincial landscape, so we are seeing more push and desire to make shared service successful. Uh, to do so, integration would need uh, to be required. So again, with, with those, that municipality, again, they're, they're outlining and saying that they're doing a shared service chief right now, administration, but in order for it to fully work, they need to be integrated. Uh, another example that I thought was probably one of the best uh, I was able to find was Innisfil and Bradford, West Gwillenberry. So I received a lot of information from uh, some of the fire members there that they were able to help me out. <clears throat> and what they provided me with reports uh, and, in it, and what they looked there is they started the same thing. They started in, in May of 2020 um, to explore the shared services and they started with a joint fire chief between the two municipalities. <clears throat> what they did was they then hired a consultant uh, to do a review of the fire operations to see what's the best direction for them to go in that time frame. So it took them a, just over a year for the consultant firm to do the review and they reported back their findings in a, a lengthy report. So what the findings were was they gave four options. Option was, Option one was to be two completely separate fire departments. So what they would do is go back, they would each be their own fire department um, and be totally independent of each other. Option two was separate fire departments with a joint chief, but both fire departments would operate separately and pursue service level improvements independent of each other. However, the departments would share a fire chief. It was determined that this model may not be feasible for both towns, even though the financial impact is marginally lower than option one, which is se with staying separate. It still involves all the duplication of efforts and costs highlighted in option one and has the added complexity of having the fire chief report to two separ separate towns following two separate standards, policies, operating procedures, and service goals. This model has also, also has technology-related challenges. Option three was consolidate the fire department. Both fire departments would consolidate into a joint service with one town operating as the primary employer. Option four was consolidate fire department, but this would fall under a independent board or corporation. But the problem with this one is uh, the legislation in the FPPA would have to be changed, so this is really not an option that they could really go forward with. So. The financial, sorry, the, uh, the consultant firm kind of laid out some of the different uh, options that they could go with, um, with the consideration that they kind of broke it down as to the, um, what's the best option as to what's not the best option. Um, so what they said was option one and option three, which is staying separate or joining, so showed the best results. Option two of a joint fire chief was not the best result to go forward, and option four, obviously, because of the changes in the FPPA that needs to be needed, was also not a consideration. So they've taken the shared service and not just said we're going down one avenue. They explored multiple options to see what's going to work for their city. Uh, I know at that last meeting it was brought up by several councillors that they said that they don't know what it's going to look like. They want the best for the city department going forward. Well, we're just trying to mainstream down one avenue. We're only looking at one aspect of it, and that's a sh shared fire chief. We're not, I guess my question is, why are we not branching this off to say, if we want the best for Port Coburn, why are we not either A, hiring a uh, consultant firm to, to do this, to give us a report back? Why are we not looking at a fully consolidated um, fire departments between us and them, or do we have to stay completely separate? Why are we only looking at one avenue? And it seems that that is what's being pushed moving forward. Um, one other municipality that I've also referenced and looked into is Central York, which includes the town of Aurora and Newmarket. So they have been fully con uh, co consolidated and, and merged since 2002, and they've had no issues going forward. So they took two towns fully uh, merged them and then have been doing that since 2002. So these are some of the, the um, reports and municipalities that I've looked into that are also tried to explore this and look, went down that avenue. I guess what I, I don't see, and, and, and 
what's not being provided to us is where has this worked as a shared fire chief, right? Where is that information coming to us? I've, I've done my homework, I guess you can say, in my research to kind of come to you guys and, and put this on the table and, and I guess educate a bit as to where it hasn't worked and what they kind of did with it. But we're not being told where it's working in just a joint fire chief, right? None of those are coming forward. So in the actual um, report that's for you tonight, as I went through it and looked at it, nowhere in this report is I, do I see anything that says that the fire department is going to be part of this committee or have any say of it. So how are we not having a say in, in what's happening when they shared service when it actually affects us? In the report, it also says that senior staff from both city and um, and, and the township met to discuss the next steps. So what are the next steps? The next steps are, I guess, a committee, but we don't know what the next steps. It also says that um, uh, given the considerable interest in the topic, senior staff recommend that a full report and proposal on sharing uh, fire administrative services be presented at this, at this joint meeting with councils. So obviously there is already a proposal that's going forward with no input from anybody. So who's putting the input in? How is this report going forward when there's no input from the fire service? We haven't been told what's going on. There's a committee that's going forward. There's obviously some type of an agenda or a proposal that's going forward to your council and Wayne Fleet's council. So there's already kind of a plan in place. What is the plan? I've put in for a request to sit on the committee. I've heard back from three councillors on it, but no one from city staff has responded to me. So why have I not been informed if I can sit on this committee or not? So these are some of the questions that I think have to be answered and how are we going to explore what's going forward, right? I think we need to look at not rushing this. Maybe we have to look at a, a, um, a, a hiring a, a consultant firm to do a, con, uh, a consultant to this. Maybe we have to be able to look at several options as to how we're going to address it and not just focus on one aspect of it. When we know or show proof that how this has worked in other municipalities. Because at right now, I have not seen any of those. So we're trying to rush this in 120 days where other municipalities that I've spoke to have taken anywhere from two years to five years to get where they are right now and that's been to consolidate or go back. So we're rushing something very quickly that's gonna have a drastic impact on us as the fire department, the city, and the members um, of the community. So another question I have is, at what point does- Mike, One minute. Okay, thank you. Uh, at what point does the, the public get a say in this, right? Do, do we need to hold a public meeting with, with public to come in and, and have voice their concerns? Right? So these are some of the things that we're trying to just push through uh, with little input from the community, right? little input from the fire department, and I don't know where the council stands with it, but we're not getting provided all the information to make it a true and very accurate um, decision what's going to be best going forward. I want to see what's best for, uh, if there is a better option, I I'm open for it. Right? I want what best, like Councillor Bodner said, that we want best for the for the community and I'm open for that but we have to look at other options besides just one I think in my opinion so I don't I don't know my timing but I, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions thanks Mike I'll go to councillors Councillor Bruno thanks Mike and thanks for doing your part after um, what we talked about in the last meeting as you as council will require uh, recall um, you know it was fire service bring forward some options, fire service maybe can involve it. You're probably ahead of us in, in having these reports and I'd like to see the rest. But if you work together, somebody's gotta be first and sounds like you were first on this. So I think we need some of those reports. I don't think there's a question that you asked that isn't worthy of an answer or an explanation. And I also think that if we're really gonna be serious about doing this, uh, that we need to get on with it and I think the more, um, I think what it needs, quite frankly, um, to my colleagues, is I, I, if, if you're up for it, Mike, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think if we had um, you and Mr. Louie 
sit in a room, and if that's three hours or five hours, do it. Do it as soon as possible. And see what's common and what is of concern. Because what I'm sure of is that if you two sit together for three or four hours and talk about what's percolating at Port Coburn and, 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 uh, and the township, and yourself and your ideas like the things you brought forward, I guarantee you that the next day you'll know more than you know today. And that, and that goes for um, Mr. Louie too. So yeah, I mean, I think there's an issue of timing. I think there's an issue of people's anxiety. But you know, if you want to get something done and parties are willing to sit down in your, your positive presentation there, I think we can at least get to some pillars that maybe both sides can agree on. And there'll be some we probably won't. But it would be the start of clearing the air on what we might be thinking. I have no problem with other models besides shared services, but I think it would be great if you guys could do that and we get reported back to inside of a week or by next council meeting. And the other thing is, I really believe on the four month thing, that at the end of the day, what you ha I don't think everybody who wants the best for the city of Port Coburn shouldn't be worried if we only got 80% done in, in four months. I think both sides would be understanding that that's great. Let's try and push the other on. But I, I don't want a, a elongated thing. And, and particularly because I think if you don't set a deadline, there's no energy to get there. And so I'm all on board of... of um, of us as a council, my colleagues agree, to ask for that if, if, if you are. And I think at the end of the day, when you want to get there, it depends on how much, honestly, money and resources you want to pour at it. Because I think we could get there in a lot less than a year. But I don't know that until you two guys have an opportunity to have a free and unencumbered conversation to see if there is common ground, and to your point, if there are other models. I don't think anybody, my colleagues here that I've known them for a while, are not open to new ideas or new models. So um, I've kind of jumped the shark on getting to the end without asking questions, because I really don't have any questions of you after you've given that presentation, other than um, are you willing to get at it? and? Mr. Louis, are you? Are you? And I'll, I'll ask you that question. I've, I've asked Mike. CAO. Sure. Uh, to be your worship, to Council Bruno, I think like all options should be considered, and all um, voices should be heard. I know Chief Alcock, Morgan Alcock, has met with Mr. Radzkowski a few days ago, or maybe over a week ago, and already talked about getting some input or having some input. I think. There's, a, there's an association that represents our city volunteers, in addition to the full-timers, and Wayne Fleet's township volunteers, and they, their voice should be heard too. I do agree with the notion that was brought up that the public's voice should be heard. Um, there is an amount of work that takes place before something comes to council. You know, I certainly don't go and watch the fires getting fought, and I don't think Mr. Radzkowski sits in on my meetings, but we have to figure out where before something comes to council and gets approved uh, that input will take place. And I can assure you that there is not a finished, polished off plan ready to go to council on at some future closed meeting, despite what you said. I can assure you, through your worship to the de delegate, um, we, are in a, we are in a stage of progress, if that makes sense. I thank you for bringing forward those uh, examples of places where there is shared administration or shared fire. We did have, I think, almost all of those. I also have, just to name a few, Fire Chief Chris Harrows, the Fire Chief of Mapleton, uh, Wellington North, and Minto. I also have about 10 or 15 more. Uh, Fire Chief Randy Aslins, the Chief of Dawson, Lake of the Woods, and West Rainy River. Some of these municipalities are a little bit smaller, are a little bit more rural. Some of them, not all of them are blended departments with volunteers and fire uh, fighters who are full-time. Uh, South Wold West Elgin, Sterling Radon, Rodden, sorry, and Tweed, 
you did mention Huntsville and Lake of Bays, which we had on our list, uh, Midland and Penetanguishing. So there are some examples out there, to your point. I think there's also the idea of using a consultant to sort of say what's the best answer to provide the best you know, protection for both communities or, or only our own community if it ends up that there isn't a bundled service. So I appreciate the insight and I'm willing to sit down for three hours whenever you want. Yeah, and if that can take place prior to our meeting with Wayne Fleet, because we are only one party of a two party yeah. system here, guys. So once that meeting takes place and then the, the map is, is laid out, there's no map yet. We have to sit down with, with our counterparts in Wayne Fleet and decide to go through that. Um, and that's exactly what a number of us have talked about on who are the parties to be involved with that, how the committee structure is. I mean, again, it's the two party system and that's where that'll come from. But if Scott can sit down with you, Mike, prior to that, then he can bring that to the table with our meeting with Wayne Fleet. And I'm sure they'll do the same thing with their people. Yep. And it's good that you, you sat down with, with our, or our acting chief, which as of tomorrow, he's our acting chief, or maybe yeah, midnight tonight. Midnight tonight. tonight. Yeah. Uh, he's our acting chief, so it's good that you sat down already. So, Any further questions to Mike? Great, thank you. Sorry, just to say that I am I am good with sitting down with, with Scott uh, to go forward. <laughs> we kind of so, got that. <laughs> thank you. Can I, Mr. Mayor, one other question? So, just on the end of this, so when is our when is that scheduled meeting again, Mr. Mayor? The uh, acting clerk will do that. Okay. She'll, she'll get so what works for us in Wayne Fleet. That, that's common date that works. That's the sooner the better, correct? Yeah. Yep. So once this is passed, that gives the permission for the clerk to get a hold of Wayne Fleet's clerk and, and plan that meeting as soon as possible. So when you have this sit down, um, maybe you can come up with uh, how you get that information back to all of us? Sure. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, and I think then the other uh, examples that the CAO has given, I mean, I'm sure we'll collect that information. I mean, there's the fire marshal's office that you'd want to talk to. There's, as you said, a consult that you want to bring in. But anyways, uh, our next delegate is Lindsay Platsky. So again, just press the red button, state your name and address, and you've got your 10 minutes. Yep, it's Lindsay Platsky, 109 Kent Street here in Port Colburn. I'm just here to, again, speak on uh, behalf of a shared services arrangement, I guess, that we're working on with Wayne Fleet. Um, after listening to the last three plus hours of council meeting, um, it's very clear that this town is pushing towards growth, is pushing towards um, new buildings, new homes, new residents, and tourism. Um, yet we're taking away from full-time firefighters, um, management in within fire um, all the higher ups are not getting replaced and this has not been going on for a, a couple weeks not knowing that our chief was gonna leave it's been going on for months and this planning for the shared services has been going on since last year so to say that this is a brand new thought process is completely moot like it this has been going on longer than we're willing to admit out in public the public did not know that this was a thing. The public didn't know that we were going to have a closed door meeting and no longer have a deputy that would have naturally replaced our chief. The current um, job description for the fire chief that is still posted, even though it was supposed to be removed on the 31st, but I guess for, for optics sake, we left it up. Thank you. Um, is 16 pages long of job description for one fire chief to handle one fire department and here we are sitting trying to get somebody part-time in another municipality to do that job and replace our administrator and replace our deputy fire chief as well at the same time i think there's a huge um, satisfaction in knowing that the public is coming forward and saying that they do not agree from both Wayne Fleet and from both Port Coburn um, and even exploring this and waiting the extra four months to wait for our anything to happen really we that's four months of delay of hiring somebody that could be perfectly qualified to take over this position tomorrow we said at the last meeting that there was quite likely 
a number of candidates that had come forward already that we're just sitting on hold for, for no reason whatsoever, other than just entertaining this idea. Um, I think there's a huge conflict in the familial and marital status of uh, members of both townships being a part of a committee that they've basically named themselves in, um, which is also a concern of both municipalities as our lovely social media presence tells us. Um, we have a job description that states 24 seven access for this job. Um, to have a full-time chief, deputy chief, and administrative assistant that we haven't replaced. Um, it's a very demanding work to environment. Intensive visual concentration, intensive listening and concentration. Uh, we have 22 volunteers. We don't have 28 volunteers as the job description states, so we're already short for that. And what goes on in the future when we don't have people volunteering anymore? The organizational chart um, that is posted within the city's job description runs CAO, fire chief, deputy chief, executive administrative assistant, and then indirectly a mechanical officer, a chaplain, full-time firefighters, which we're missing one, and then the vol volunteer firefighters that we're apparently missing six. So we're already shorted right there, and there was no consultation other than a closed door meeting to ensure that we weren't gonna replace those positions. Um, I guess a um, freedom of information was rejected by the council, so there was no way for us to know who voted which way to not replace the chief, or sorry, a deputy chief and a firefighter. Um, and I do want to apologize to the members of council that did vote against that, but we'll never know unless that information is released by the city. So that's where I'll leave it because I'd like to go home tonight. Um, Thanks, Lindsay. Just a correction. Council does yeah. not have anything to do with freedom of information. Information That's the clerk's department. Oh, no doubt. So it's not the council. Okay. Just to, I want to make sure that's clear. Yes, it, it's clear, but it doesn't help you. That's the problem. It doesn't help the public know that you guys, which way you guys voted, even though we voted for you. Yeah, okay. so in camera, stays in camera unless it comes out here. Yeah. There are certain circumstances in camera does come back out to public process. Some always stay in camera forever on a lot of issues. So not I, every in camera meeting or subject that is spoken about in camera ever comes back to a public table. That's just the way the Municipal Act works and that's the rules that we follow. So respectfully our, not replacing a full time employee doesn't hurt anybody's privacy. You're not speaking about a person, a person. You're speaking about a position that's already paid for by the taxpayer. I just want to clarify about yep. FOIs. That's understood. All. Thanks. Yep. No problem. Any questions? Okay. Thank you, Lindsay. You're okay. So, with regards to 8.8, .8, I have Councillor Bruno for questions. Do you have any questions? No, I think uh, that's uh, pretty much it with the okay. conversation. Thank you. Mr. Wojciechowski, thanks. Councilor Hoyle? Uh, to the Mayor, uh, Councilor Bruno actually answered like most of my questions once again. Um, I just want to make sure that there was uh, members of the fire service or people that understood the fire service, a part of this group, because it doesn't make sense to just have uh, people that have never experienced it or been a part of it making these kind of decisions. That was my say. Yeah, so I suggest that you bring that forward when we do meet with Wayne Fleet. Uh, yes, I will. Great, thank you. Further questions? <coughs> Councillor Elliott. Thank you, Mayor. Um, real quick, I guess, are we still searching for a full-time chief? CIO. Yeah, through your worship to Councillor Elliott, as per the instructions from the last, sorry, the March 19th special meeting, which was not the last meeting of Council, March 19th, the job has stayed up, the deadline has been removed, and we're contacting every applicant to tell them that we're on this one or the other track of going to replace the fire chief or enter into a shared service agreement. I took that away from Council Direction on March 19th. 
So one or the other. So when do, when, when do we make up our mind on what's one or the other? Well, we're following direction of council, councilor. Okay, so, so we're going to, so we're, I, I get second. Second. So Mayor. those have been talked about, those have been voted on. Right. This is the next step. We vote on this tonight. And then we take that step and we move forward. So basically we've got two roads running parallel that we're following. We're inviting people to apply for a position that's full-time fire chief. And at the same time, we're going down the road where we're having a meeting to talk about a shared service. Yeah, so this has already been decided, Councillor. Right. Okay. So does that not show somebody that's applying for a position of full-time? I'm applying for a position. I don't know if it's going to be there. Right? The optics of what we're doing to somebody that may want a full-time position if it, the full-time position is there, may have them want to remove their application. I'm confused. I read this report and it's like, this is a done deal. This is a done deal. We're, we're getting together with, with Wayne Fleet Council. And I'm not, I'm not going, no. Yeah, please don't so, clap. Because I am, I am literally confused at what this says. Because this says we're getting together with Wayne Fleet Council and we're going we're gonna to come together and we're going to decide how we're going to do this. Correct. So the full-time chief is off, off the board. That's what, that's what I'm getting out of this report. And, yeah, but that's, and that's, again, Councillor, this is a decision that Council voted on, so we're moving forward with this. So I think the CAO answer but is it, that they are contacting those. I'm sure if some of them, if Joe Smith has put his name in, he may say, I'll withdraw my name. I don't know what those conversations are because I'm not part of those. But I'll, that's, that's why they up. are con contacting those people that have put their name forward. Have we interviewed anybody? We haven't interviewed any? So we're worshiping Council Elliot, no. We're waiting to see what the outcome of this process is. In the normal course of business in human resources, you close a, p a posting, you shortlist your candidates, you come up with a number that you are going to interview, five, six, seven, you have a round of interviews. Maybe you come up with two or three that are going to go to a second round of interviews. We would be closing the application, but Council asked me on March 19th not to close the application. That was at council's yeah. direction. So it's an open-ended application process with no with no end date. Not at this time, no. no. Okay. <laughs> it's a pretty funny way of trying to attract people to come to work for you. That's that's fairly uncommon. I would say that you would have a drop that date and have your applications in by this time and then go through your process, but but we're doing it differently. That's the direction of council, councilor. And, and that's why, and I'll go back to this again, that's why in March 19th meeting I said, put your feelings forward. Where do you stand? Have a vote of this council to say, do you want a full-time chief or no? Cut and dry. Make your decision. <clears throat> We'll go, down, we'll go down the road with Wayne Fleet if that's what the majority of council wants to do with no chance of a full-time chief. And we'll just work it out and go with shared services. Or we'll have this council vote to hire a full-time fire chief. But we won't do that. No, we voted to sit down with Wayne Fleet and talk about this. And, and that's, that's why I again. asked in March 19th, but the direction make up your mind on what you want to do but Councillor, I'm, I'm going to stop you right there because we're not going to re-debate this. This has already been decided. That's fine. I, I'm there just... is a recommendation. I, we, we need to deal with the recommendation tonight. We right. have an opportunity to vote yes or no for it, but the majority of council is given direction, so we need to move forward. So I, I, would, I would say if you want to have this, this get-together, like yeah. Mr. Radzikowski had said, how are you going to create a panel without anybody that has experience? So let, I'll let Councillor Elliott speak first. Without, without talking, well, I, I would think that we could decide as our council right here that as we go into the meeting, we would decide that we want somebody on the panel that's going to talk about this to have some experience in the fire department, like Councillor Hoyle said. Well, well that's why I 
said to Councillor Hoyle, bring that forward at the meeting. That's where he said he would do that. Right. So are we going to agree with that as a council to do that? Well, I think we'll do that talking at that meeting and decide it there. Let's, let's again. It, it, but why don't we decide that as a council? <laughs> that that's what we want to do. Because that's why we're having the joint meeting with Wayne Fleet. I think that's where that needs to be talked about. But, but and both sides need to be heard, Councillor. That, that's all. I, that's, that's, what, that's the direction that's been given by this council. Right, and, and I get that. So, but the point I'm trying to make is we can't even decide as a council that we want to bring our position to the table that says we want, even from Wayne Fleet, from Wayne Fleet's side, people at the table with experience in the fire department. Well, I think at that meeting, you, you probably will hear that. But what, our council can't decide that here. With us, well, that I would be our position going in. Well, we may have several positions going in. You may have different opinions from different councillors, but I think you need to discuss that with Wayne Fleet and, and come out with a, with a plan w which way we're going to move forward with this. Well, I, I'm just saying that that's how it would normally work. Well, normally work. We haven't even done this before. Well, yeah, maybe not in this case, but lots of things have been done that you've talked to other municipalities about, and that's how it has been done. You've you got to have that conversation before you're... You can't go in with just one avenue. You've got to be open to conversation that night. Wayne Fleet may come forward with a great idea that you like, and you're saying, hey, I can back that, and, and we do. Right, and we or might we may with, do we the same thing with them. And we I, might come in with a great, great idea that says we want to have people at the table with experience exactly so then we talk about that we figure out where we're going from there and then we come back that's how it's going to work okay all right uh further questions seeing none so we have a recommendation on the table if i could have councillors uh bruno and Baggio move that recommendation again further comments all in favor opposed that's carried Item 8.9. So item 8.9 is council composition and ward boundary review. I have Councillor Bruno. Uh, thank you, Worship. I was just um, hoping that um, that the scope of work that we'd ask for, or anybody's idea on council, would be shared with um, the consultant via the person um, taking it. I just want to make sure that there's going to be input by the council um, so that the uh, consultant will know, here's some of the things we'd like you to include in your study. So can that be accomplished? Yep. Go ahead. Uh, through your worship to Councillor Bruno, and, and sorry, you know this is a this is a project that was approved. Jeez, asked for by council last term, approved in the last budget, and here we are looking for a little bit of a reserve transfer to make sure that it funds the full budget amount. The the main event wasn't really what the project is; it right. was sort of the financing. But I will jump into the project here and explain that the bid that was the successful bid, and a couple of staff here were on the scoring committee, a really, really high quality bid. It had sort of two rounds of the project and it had a number of rounds of public consultation and one-on-one -on -one meetings with council. So I think all nine council members, and I don't have the document in front of me, I apologize. All nine council members will get a one-on-one -on -one sit down with the consultant that's doing the exercise. Set, okay. Councillor Danch had a question, but he's not here. We want to wait till he's back. Sure. Can wait till he's back. Anybody else got a question on it? <laughs> All right. We'll wait for Councillor Danch to come back. <laughs> What's that? I need to go ask him one more Wait for your question. 
on uh, ward boundary, uh, composition and ward boundary review. You're, you're on my list for a question. Yeah, did we not change that to the last election? Well, put your uh, mic on. Did we not change that at the last election because Kalali Street <coughs> was changed as so, a ward? Well, you weren't in the room when the I had to CAO gave us a bit of an overview, but he'll do the same thing because it actually answers the question. <laughs> CAO. Yeah, yeah. Uh, through your worship to Councillor Dancer, it's a good question. Um, again, you know, we're not here about the main project. We're here about the budget money, but I will get into the main project too, like I did for the other councillor's question, which was about uh, whether the council members will get a one-on-one -on -one interview with the consultant. Councillor Danch, is it correct that we made an adjustment to take a piece of uh, one ward and put it in the other ward just to keep the number of residents about balanced? It's not an exact science, but about balanced. But this, uh, this project, I'll go back in the history, was from the last term of council, there was a couple of council members who were very gung-ho to do it, and uh, it might be much ado about nothing. It could be the exact same status quo as the final recommendation, but they look at how many councillors you should have, whether you should have wards or not have wards, if you should have wards, what the geographic boundaries of the ward should be. So they sometimes tinker with them to make sure they're balanced in size. Um, and all of those things are a component of it. So this was done, but it was really just a housekeeping in 2018's or sorry, uh, 22's election for making sure that the distribution of voters was even. Councillor, you all right with that? I get it. I mean, like I said, I read this. I said, I, I knew, I know we made changes in the last one because, you know, Ward 3 is the number one ward. Unfortunately, we're called Ward 3, but anyways. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah. So, okay, any further questions to the report? Seeing none. So the recommendation is that Corporate Services Department Report 2024-93 be received. The Council approved the transfer of $30,000 from the over short reserve to the Council <coughs> Composition War Boundary Review Budget. If I could have Councillors Bruno and Danch move that. Again, further questions? All in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Correspondence. Okay, 9.1 is Councillor Aquilina. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm, I'm surprised I'm the only one that brought this up, but um, the region is looking for endorsement of this, and I'd like us to endorse it. Well, it's funny you say that, Councillor, only because today at our pre council meeting, I said, Do we not just deal with this? And last meeting we did. It actually oh. was uh, from the from the town of um, Bracebridge. Okay. Uh, and I actually had Councillor Bruno uh, bring. I can't remember who seconded it, but I'm looking through my correspondence from that. I couldn't find it only because we brought it forward and changed to support as opposed to receive. So it went to a different part of that uh, agenda, which thank God the CAO found. Um, but we did. We can still support this. It's the same thing. But I think. From the letter that came the last time, we've we've sent our response out. This pretty much mirrors that that came through regional council. But again, I think it's good to re, uh, say we support it. We can send have the clerk send a letter to the clerk of the region stating that we do support what the region says here. Is that fine? Can I get Councillor uh, Oil to second that? Okay. Further questions? This is to support council. All in favor? That's carried. I thought I was going crazy today. I'm going, I know I brought this up because I know Councilor Bruno made the motion to receive it, so that was good. Uh, okay, item 9.2, again, Councilor Aquilina. So, again, the region was looking for endorsement of this, and so I'm bringing it forward. Yeah, so this uh, is respect, respecting uh, federal uh, infrastructure investment. I think everybody's got it in front of them. I don't need to read everything here. Again, Councillor Ackerman is bringing this up for support. If I could have Councillor Beauregard second that. Any questions? All in favor? That's carried. Item 9.5. is the township of Adelaide Metcalf with regards to increased tile drain loan limit. Councillor Bodner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I'd like us to uh, support this and not just receive it. Um, our rural area, a lot of the farmers do uh, 
tile drainage. And this is asking that the maximum annual limit of loans that hasn't been changed since 2004 and is 50,000 be increased to $100,000. So I think it's to support that. Okay. Uh, seconder to that, Councilor Hoyle. Questions? All in favor? That's carried. And with regards to who it's going to, we'll send it to the same people on this one. Uh, yeah. All right, Madam Clerk. And then item 910, 9.10, is from the Corporation of the County of Prince Edward. Uh, it's with regards to a deadline of an accessible Ontario by 2025. This was carried, Councillor Bruno, or Councillor Bruno, Councillor Bodner. Sorry. Or, sir, yeah. This is asking uh, for a creation of a municipal accessibility fund for municipalities <coughs> and I'd like us to uh, support this rather than just receive it. Okay, thank you. Councilor Aquilini will second that. Okay, and you had some comments on this one too? <coughs> Do you have, or sorry, before I go to you, any fur anything further, Councilor? No. no. Councilor Aquilino. I'll hit your mic again. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, same as Councillor Botner. Um, I think I brought uh, I brought this up during um, staff's presentation of the progress <coughs> report um, that there was uh, huge concerns that the province was built, falling behind in their commitment for 2025. Um, so. In addition to um, the funding, I'd also like to support uh, moving forward, whether it's as a municipality or bringing it forward to the Joint Accessibility Committee, that, um, that I think we need to take this seriously, that, that we're behind meeting 2025 as a province. Okay, so this is to support. So. With regards to this for Councillor Bodner and Aquilina, the very end it, it shows who they're sending it to. So I think all the ministries that are included in here, also the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and AMO, I don't think we need to send it to the Eastern Ontario Wardens Caucus and all Ontario municipalities. They've already done this. However, we should include our four MPPs within Niagara. Is that all right, Council, to add that friendly amendment? Okay. Further questions, comments? Okay. Madam Clerk, you know what we're doing on this one. Thank you. All those in favor? That's carried. Okay. There's no motions this evening. Are there any notices of motion, Council? Seeing none. We have minutes of boards and committees. We have the museum uh, board of February 20th, 24, the heritage uh, subcommittee of January 22nd and February 12, 2024, and the Pork Warren Public Library of March 6, 2024. I'll do this in block. Councillor Dan and Elliott to move those. Questions on any of those minutes? All in favor? That's carried. We have bylaws of, uh, from 20.1 through to 20.7. Can I have councillors uh, Bagu and Bruno move those? Questions on any of the bylaws? All in favor? Those are carried. That's it. Thank you for watching this evening. We thank our crowd for coming, and our meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>